Episode one of The Morning Show starts out with Chip Black, the executive producer of The Morning Show, getting a phone call. And seemingly everybody that is involved with The Morning Show is getting the same phone call. And that phone call is to alert them that Mitch Kessler, one of the staples of The Morning Show, has been fired for sexual harassment. Now Chip is constantly trying to get in touch with his co-anchor, Alex Levy, but she's not picking up the phone, so it results in Chip having to meet her outside of The Morning Show headquarters. But when she gets the news, she's shocked. She's also pissed at Chip because... Chip knew that they were looking into these allegations, but he didn't tell Alex. The sexual harassment had been leaked to the New York Times, and because of that, it forced UBA, the company that owns the morning show, it forced their hand. And this is all happening at about 3.30 in the morning. So Alex is pissed off at Chip, but Chip says, look, you told me to stay away from you. You told me to kind of not alert you to these sort of things. But she's pissed off because this is not a little thing. This is her TV husband we're talking about. And because this is happening so soon, and the morning show goes live in a few hours, they're having to throw Yanko Flores, the meteorologist of the morning show, into Mitch's chair. But UBA, along with Chip, have to do damage control on how to handle this whole situation. So Chip gets on a phone call with Corey Ellison, who's the new head of the news division. He came from entertainment, but he's only been doing news for about a month. And his boss, Fred. And what they decide is to address this thing head on, address it as soon as the morning show starts, Alex will address the nation and say exactly what happened, and that they're horrified to learn of these allegations. But Alex is having to do all this in the middle of a contract negotiation with UBA. So in a way, this couldn't come as a worse time for her, but in a way, it's kind of the best time for her. And as she's trying to mentally prepare herself for this speech, Mitch is constantly calling her, but she's ignoring the phone calls. And finally, it's time to actually start the show, and Alex kills it. She dials in, she gives a completely spectacular performance, and it's one of her best performances in years. And while she's doing this, Mitch is at home with all of his lawyers and his team, watching this feeling like he's getting railroaded by someone that he's known for 20 years and worked with. He's listening to his TV wife tell the nation how disappointed she is in him, and he feels kind of betrayed because of it. And when Mitch is seeing this, Mitch kind of just starts to flip out a little bit. It slowly builds from him saying that he didn't rape anybody, the women came on to him, they wanted it. The typical stuff you'd think you'd hear from a guy charged with sexual harassment. But then he takes it one step further and just grabs a fire poker and starts bashing his TV in because he just can't bear to witness it any longer. To make matters worse, his wife comes in the room and tells him that she's filing for divorce because she hasn't really liked him in about two to three years anyway. Now this story is sweeping the nation and it's catching the eye of everybody in the industry, including a field anchor named Bradley Jackson who is reporting from bumfuck West Virginia. And she's heading to a coal mine protest along with her cameraman and producer and she doesn't really get along with her producer too much. And when they arrive, her producer tries to give her a little bit of advice and say, you know, you got to be more likable. You can't be this brash and rough around the edges. You need to smile mile more and Bradley kind of says I'm not going to change who I am and then he says well that's fine but that open anchor chair is not going to you they're giving it to the girl who's been there three years less than you because of the fact that she's likable and this really irks Bradley so she's pissed off about that and then right before she goes on camera she gets a call from her mother telling her that her mother is going to pick up her brother from rehab early and this is a rehab that Bradley had to fight to get her brother into And now her mother is just enabling her brother by picking him up early. And this pisses off Bradley even more. She's basically becoming a ticking time bomb. So right before she goes live, somebody knocks into her cameraman. And when she defends the cameraman, the guy says, shut up, you fake news bitch. And that's when Bradley snaps. She says, you probably don't even know jack shit about Cole. Give me some facts about Cole. And sure enough, he knows nothing about Cole. It gets to the point where he actually apologizes to Bradley because of the fact that he's been schooled by this journalist. But unbeknownst to Bradley, there are cameras rolling all around her, and this interaction is getting filmed. And when she gets back to the newsroom, this clip has gone viral, and it's making Bradley an internet celebrity for the moment. But she isn't focused on that. She's focused on the fact that she didn't get this open anchor chair, so she approaches her boss, and her boss points to the clip and says, this is why you're not getting that open anchor chair. And this is why you've bounced around so much. I mean, hell, there's the incidents with Two Fucks Jackson. And Two Fucks Jackson is when Bradley was starting out in the industry, She said fuck live on air. And when she realized she said fuck on air, she said fuck again, hence the nickname Two Fucks Jackson, and it's carried her throughout her entire career. So when he brings this up, it pisses off Bradley even more, and she quits on the spot. Now, as I said, that clip went viral, and one of the people that saw the clip was a PA on the morning show named Claire, who calls over the head booker of the morning show, a girl named Hannah, and says, hey, you were looking for strong female empowerment? I think I found it right here. So Hannah heads down to bumfuck West Virginia to try to get Bradley to get on the morning show. With the recent sexual harassment allegations against Mitch, it's a good look for the morning show to have the strong female empowerment angle. 
But when Hannah finds Bradley, Bradley is at her mother's house discussing how important it is for her brother to have stayed in rehab. And it just seems like her and her mom, her brother, they don't really have the best relationship. Now, Bradley and her brother have a good relationship, but Bradley is frustrated with her mother and how she babies and enables her addict of a brother. So when Hannah shows up at the doorstep, it kind of takes Bradley off guard, but she says, yeah, sure, I'll go because it's the morning show. And also her schedule just got freed up because she got, you know, let go slash quit slash fired. Now, speaking of New York, the morning show is wrapped and Alex Levy is still extremely pissed off. She starts reaming in a Chip about this whole situation, basically saying it was his fault because he's the executive producer. To make matters worse for Chip, Corey and Fred, the heads of UBA, have shown up and it takes Chip a little bit off guard and he says, oh, I'm surprised to see you here. And Corey says, Chip, when the Exxon Valdez smashes into a rock and a bunch of crude oil spills into the ocean, you drop what you're doing and you show up. And that kind of tells you the magnitude of this situation. So Corey's in town to meet with Chip and Alex is currently meeting with her team, her agents, her lawyers. And now she's trying to look out for number one. And the good news for Alex is, because of the fact they fired Mitch, the power in the contract negotiations have shifted to Alex because they obviously cannot lose both Alex and Mitch. And you could just see in the look in Alex's face that she's extremely exhausted through this whole situation. But that quickly changes when her daughter shows up. Her daughter is in town to see a play with her school, but she's also in town because Alex is going to receive an award in a few days. And right behind her daughter is her husband. Now, they're separated, but they still have a very good relationship. And Alex is just relieved to finally see her daughter through this whole situation. But unfortunately for Alex, the entertainment business is pretty cutthroat. And while she's hugging her daughter, Corey and Chip are meeting to discuss the future of the morning show. And Corey says, look, it's great that she she was dialed in today, but she hasn't been dialed in for a while. And to make matters worse, the morning show's ratings have dipped. So maybe the fact that Mitch is no longer here, maybe it's going to reinvigorate Alex and it'll actually help the show. He reminds Chip that they're not in the news industry. People get news on their phones in a matter of seconds. They're in the entertainment industry and they're here to entertain. And the entertaining ones will get the ratings and the ratings get the ad dollars. Now, because of everything that happened with Mitch, Alex has decided that one of the things that she wants from her new contract is co-host approval. But UBA is completely pushing back on that. But it's very important to Alex because chemistry is everything to her. She's extremely stressed out when she shows up for work on Tuesday because of the whole contract negotiation. And as she sits in her chair getting makeup and hair done, she's watching Bradley Jackson's clip and she's not buying it. She thinks that Bradley Jackson knew the cameras were rolling and kind of orchestrated this whole thing to become a viral sensation. And because of this, it makes for a very awkward interview and a very awkward interaction between Bradley and Alex. Right off the bat, Alex is very rude to Bradley. And when she starts interviewing her, she kind of challenges her on the fact that, did you know the cameras were rolling? But Bradley handles it beautifully. She defends herself and then at the very end compliments Alex. And this really impresses Corey, who ends up calling Bradley that night and says, you know, you should really meet me at my hotel for a drink to discuss your future. Bradley says, is this my big break? And he says, that's up to you. So while Bradley is getting the call, Alex is finally going to face her demons, and she ends up breaking into Mitch's house. And when Mitch comes downstairs, he doesn't find a burglar, but he finds his former co-host, and she's pissed. She starts accosting him for putting her in this situation and just calling him stupid for what he did. And he's trying to play this off as the victim. Now, through this whole argument, you do find out that they did, in fact, have sex twice. But more importantly, she's pissed off because they had such good chemistry on the set. And it was extremely important to her to keep that going. And as Alex goes to leave, Mitch drops another bombshell that they were actually looking to push her out. She doesn't initially buy it, but he says, no, they came to me and they were actively looking to get rid of you. And that's maybe why they were dragging their feet on the contract negotiations. In episode two, Bradley ends up meeting with Corey in the hotel bar, and it's not lost in her that she's meeting with the head of a studio at a hotel bar on the heels of sexual harassment allegations. But he puts her mind at ease and says, hey, I understand this is what it looks like, but I only sleep with people that want to sleep with me. But it becomes clear pretty early on that Bradley is not here to exchange pleasantries, and she's very upfront about everything, to the point where Corey says, do you treat every single business meeting like a war? And she says, well, every business meeting is. And the problem is she still hasn't gotten her answer on what she's doing there. And finally, Corey tells her, I want you to be a part of the morning show, but you've got some issues in your past. She cuts him off right there and says, I can explain two fucks Jackson, and he says, two fucks what? Because Corey had no idea about this story, and she says, I'll explain later. Corey proceeds on to tell her that she'll have a meeting tomorrow with Chip Black, the morning show producer, at 9.30 and to be prepared for it. And even after all this, her guard is still up. Now the next day, Alex arrives at the office and everyone's trying to prepare for the speech that she has, but all she's concerned about is her contract. And as soon as she gets in her dressing room, she calls her agent. She asks, do you think the fact that the network is stalling is their way of trying to push me out? And the agent is honest with her and says, 
It's not the best sign in the world, but right now we have them by the balls. But Alex is still stressed out and demands that her agent get the deal done as soon as possible, but also get everything they're demanding, including co-host approval, which the network has no interest in doing. But Alex isn't the only one that is stressed out in the office. This includes the fill-in co-host Yanko Flores, who's usually the meteorologist, but now is doing the fill-in job of Mitch. And he's stressed out because he is dating Claire, the PA, the same PA that found Bradley Jackson. And they have a consensual relationship going on, but because of these allegations, he's concerned that the optics are not good. And when he kind of pushes Claire away, she gets a little put off by this. You can totally understand his hesitation. Now, right before the show actually is going to go live on air, Fred and Corey meet with the staff to kind of put the fear of God into the staff. Fred really spearheads the meeting and gives an update on the sexual harassment allegations but then says how important it is that they have a good show because May sweeps are coming up. And they've already lost plenty of ad dollars to their competition. Fred does the whole boss thing where you say, if you can't do it, we'll find somebody who can, and is once again trying to put the fear of God into these people. But Corey is behind his back just nodding and saying, no, that's not true, and kind of trying to put the staff at ease. When the meeting wraps up, Corey and Fred end up having a private conversation, and Fred tells Corey that we have to have a plan together to get Alex off the show. But Billy assures him that that's already in the works. Fred tells him that when we put you in this position, and I'll remind you, less than a month ago, we had no idea we'd be facing the toughest crisis in this station's history. But Corey shoots back, well, some people would say that you should have. Fred gives him a death stare and says, I know what you're doing, and the fact that you just started here doesn't give you leverage right now. And Corey very calmly says, I'm not looking for leverage, Fred. I'm just stating the obvious. It would have been better if we knew so we could have stopped it, but we didn't know right? And this is a very accusatory right. Now, right before the show, Chip is running around doing about 50 different things, and Corey comes to him and says, hey, you're going to have a meeting with Bradley Jackson at 930. But Chip is kind of thrown. He doesn't understand why he would even waste his time having a meeting with Bradley Jackson. Corey explains to her that he wants her to interview for a correspondent job, and you got to spice things up here to boost the ratings. Chip asks him, do you have any idea how many people saw that video? And Corey says, yeah, exactly. I know how many people saw that video. This is entertainment, so meet with her at 9 but suddenly another issue occurs because right before she's going to go on air, Alex finds out that the network is not going to give in on co-host approval. And Alex has had enough and she says, I'm not going to go on air. Her and Chip continue to play this game of chicken and Alex wants him to promise her that she will get co-host approval as if Chip has that power. She's telling those around her to get ready for someone to sit in that chair because it won't be her. And Chip is telling her, I can't promise you this. I don't have that power. But finally, Alex ends up winning out just in the nick of time and Chip caves saying, I promise to get you co-host approval. And Alex goes on air, and the country has no idea what happened just 20 seconds beforehand. Now, after the Yanko Flores disaster of the previous day, he's back to weather, and they needed somebody to fill in for Mitch's chair, and they went to Daniel Henderson. Now, Daniel Henderson is a guy who is very intelligent, but feels like he's being misused on the morning show. He's black, he's gay, he's being sent to cover things like Gossip Girl the Musical, but he didn't come here for that, and he wants that chair. He meets with Chip afterwards to discuss why he isn't already in that chair, and Chip says, look, man, if you want some advice, you got to be more likable. Which is ironic, because that's the same advice that Bradley Jackson got. But he says, you know what people liked about Mitch? The fact that... They could envision sitting next to Mitch in the DMV and just having a normal conversation with him. He was like the everyman. At first, Daniel takes this as an insult, but cooler heads end up prevailing, and Chip tells him, go to this award show tonight. Ah! Go to this award show tonight, rub some elbows, and just be likable, and you could, in fact, get this chair. Now, Mitch is having to transition from one meeting to another, and this time it's with Bradley Jackson, but he doesn't want to do it. And unfortunately for Bradley Jackson... She has no idea about this. So she comes in there with ideas, but Chip doesn't want to hear any of them. He cuts her off and says, are you trying to be a correspondent or a producer? Because now I'm confused. And she says, well, I, I like to do both. So she continues to pitch him ideas, but it's obvious in this meeting that Chip is not really there. He's answering emails. He's getting interrupted. And on top of it, he's not really listening to Bradley or any of her ideas. He's just nixing them. And since Bradley isn't one to sugarcoat things, she takes it as an insult and goes after Chip saying you had no questions about these stories, you weren't even interested in them. And Chip is shocked and says, are, are you serious right now? Yeah, this meeting's over. Chip tries to walk out, but Bradley is following him, telling him how shitty the morning show is. Finally, Chip threatens to get security to remove her, and she says, listen to your last couple of stories that you had today. How many ice cream flavors are there? Two twins that met on Tinder. Your show sucks. You need real news. And then she storms out of the place. And she's ready to leave town and go back to West Virginia, but before she does, she gets a call from Corey's assistant, and the assistant tells her that Corey is requesting her to be at this award ceremony for Alex that night. And this throws her for a loop, because she says, that meeting that I just had went terribly. And the assistant 
tells her, look, all I know is that we're sending you gowns over, so I would be there if I were you. So Bradley pulls a U-turn and goes right back into the hotel. But while it seems the morning show is in shambles, it's not all bad news because Hannah, the head booker, has been able to track down a Mitch Accuser. And the Mitch Accuser was originally going to go on their competition, but Hannah convinced her to actually come on the morning show. She told her that if you go on the competition, it's going to look like you're a scorned lover. But if you go on to this show, the morning show, you're coming into Mitch Kessler's house and you are accusing him of something that is reprehensible. It will look like you are a strong woman instead of somebody who's just trying to get even. Now, speaking of Mitch, he has met with his financial advisor who says you're not going to get paid for a while. They're not paying your contract. There's a morality clause in your contract that they're exercising, so you need to scale back a bit. And Mitch is puzzled. He goes, I have more money than God. But the issue is, yes, you have more money than God. You also have three homes, three mortgages, a lavish lifestyle. You don't want to give up your apartment in New York. The financial advisor lets him know you can live like this for maybe two years and then you're going to have to go work at Trader Joe's. So Mitch is obviously stressed out and starts losing his mind over this morality clause. He says, you don't want to be the dickhead who says, no, take out the morality clause, but then they'll use it any way they want to not pay you. I mean, what is a morality clause after all? So he is enraged, but he's got a party to go to because he still plans on going to this award ceremony for his former co-host Alex tonight. And that day he gets a visit from his former producer Chip, who is begging him not to go. But Mitch tells him you have two choices when this happens you can either sit back and wait for these allegations to come and do nothing or can you can attack it and i'm planning on attacking it and chip says stop 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 trying to contact every journalist in the area to get your story out this isn't going to blow over in a day this is going to blow over in years so you're just going to have to wait and while i don't agree with your situation right now because i feel like guys are just simply being punished for years of misconduct and the quarter of public opinion is too quick to judge without hearing the other side of it it's simply the day and age that we live in so don't come to the event tonight because it's not going to be a good look for you or us but this plea falls on deaf ears and mitch says you know my suit's pressed and i'm coming and i'm gonna look every single report in the eye who trashed me and didn't ask for my side on anything so mitch is planning on heading to this event and obviously so is alex but she doesn't want to go she wants to play sick she's confiding in her family that she doesn't want to do this but when it comes time to get on the red carpet she puts on a great face and a good smile and you'd never know there was an issue so pretty much everybody in the industry is there including Corey. and right before the event chip finds Corey and tells him how bad the meeting with bradley jackson went but Corey doesn't really say much. He just kind of nods. Because unbeknownst to Chip, Bradley is coming at the behest of Corey. And no one, including Bradley for that matter, knows what she's doing there. So Corey sees her and starts ushering her over to her seat, which ironically is at the UBA table. And this throws everybody for a loop. And to make it worse, she's going to be sitting right next to Alex. And obviously those two didn't have the best first meeting. At one point she turns to Alex and says, I don't even know why I'm here. And Alex just kind of gives her a smirk and says, yeah, that makes two of us. Alex is taking it as an insult. Now, Alex and Bradley end up actually running into each other in the women's room. And Alex tells her, you're being played right now. They're putting you here to make me worried about my job. And Bradley says, yeah, it's really awkward for me. And Alex cuts her off and says, well, if it's so awkward, why don't you leave? You're an adult. Leave. If it's so awkward for you, get out. And Bradley says, you know, I'm not you. All right, I don't have the ability to go tell a head of a network to go fuck himself. And after Alex walks out of the bathroom, she sees Corey Ellison. And she says, I'm going to tell you right now, I need co-host approval or I'm walking. And Corey doesn't blink and says, okay, well, if you have to do that, then you have to do that. The conversation gets pretty heated, and it ends with Corey telling her, by the way, we bought this award for you. So at this point, Alex is pissed off and hurt. She gets up at the award ceremony to accept her award. And right before she does so, she says, everybody get your phones out because I'm going to announce the new co-anchor of the morning show. It is... Bradley Jackson to the surprise of everybody in the room including Bradley oh and if you're wondering where Mitch was this entire time he wisely decided to stay in the car and not show up episode three starts out directly after episode two and Bradley is still in shock but she's taking pictures with people but she's really just trying to figure out exactly what just happened same goes for the network executives who tell everybody to get to the studio ASAP they want to do some damage control on this because obviously they had no idea that this announcement was going to take place before he can get out of there, Corey is pressed by the media about this announcement, and he acts like it was obviously their decision, and he announces that the new morning show will start on Monday. So this gives them two days to get prepared. After making the announcement, Corey heads to the studio with Fred, and Fred is irate. He says, why shouldn't I fire you right now? 
Fred is pissed at Corey for acknowledging that this will be the show. Corey says, This morning show has been stale, and Alex's sell-by date was years ago, and everybody knew that we were going to fire her. But because Mitch was fucking everything that moved, now we have to keep her. So we're going to put this nobody in that she handpicked, and it's going to make her think that she gets a minor victory. But in reality, it's just freshening up the show. And when it comes time to actually replace Alex, we're not going to look like the bad guys. So just give me a month and it's either going to work out or it's not. But at the very least, it'll freshen up the show. So Corey and Fred are already at the studio and the two hosts are heading there. Bradley was ushered out of the event by a producer named Mia. And while in the car, Bradley tells her that she doesn't even want the job. But whether she wants it or not, she's going to the studio. When they arrive, Mia is stumping for the job as Bradley's number one producer. She's telling Chip that she's been in purgatory far too long and she's earned this. And Chip doesn't really give her an answer because he's focused on addressing the entire production team to a situation that 35 minutes ago he didn't know existed. But before he can really do it, Corey barges in the room and doubles down on this, says it's happening. Alex jumped the gun a little bit on the announcement, but they've been quietly vetting Bradley Jackson for months now. And that's one of the reasons why they're hiring her is because she's a veteran. But Chip interjects and says... Well, she's not an anchor veteran. She's never been an anchor, actually. But Corey doesn't really care about that because he's got 48 hours to figure out who Bradley Jackson is. He needs focus groups. He needs contracts. He needs wardrobe. And Mia jumps in and says it's not even a guarantee that she's going to go on on Monday. Corey's a little surprised by this and asks who she is, and she says, I'm Mia Jordan. I'm Bradley's producer. And to his credit, Chip backs her up on this. So Mia Jordan saw her shot, and she took it, and it worked out. And now Hannah, the head booker, is taking her shot. She says to the room that she has a Mitch accuser, and it's not the best optics to start a new morning show with a Mitch accuser, but it's a Mitch accuser. But Corey disagrees and says, no, that's great optics. This shows that this is a safe space for women. This will be the morning show that gives voice to the women and they won't be silenced. Now while this is going on, Alex is also heading to the studio. And she's on the phone with her agent being reamed out because her making this announcement is a breach of contract and the agent is imploring her to go into this meeting sincerely apologize and pray to God at the end of it that she still has a job because they could fire her. But Alex has no interest in doing that whatsoever. And the meeting goes about as well as her agent expected, with Fred reaming her out, telling her that she should be fired, saying a lot of words that are going in one ear and out the other, and finally Alex goes, are you done? And he, along with the rest of the room, is a little taken aback. And she says, I just want to know, are you guys done? Because the part that you don't realize is you no longer have the power. The news division is held up by my show. And the only thing keeping this news division afloat is me. Because guess what? America loves me. And therefore, I own America. So it seems pretty fucking simple, but it's so easy for you guys to forget. I don't need to justify anything to you guys. You guys think you're the rightful owner to all the power, but it doesn't even occur to you that somebody else might be in the driver's seat. So we have to gingerly step around your male egos in order not to burst your little precious bubble. Well, surprise! I'm bursting it. So we are going to do this my way, because I've let you bozos handle this long enough. And then she looks right at Fred, the head of the network, and says, I'm sorry, was that not the apology you were expecting? Alex gets up and leaves, and as she's leaving, she passes by the main studio, and she sees Bradley kind of just marveling at the empty studio. So she heads on in, and Bradley asks, why did you do this? I don't even want this. And Alex says, of course you do. I just gave you the biggest news platform you could ever have. Bradley says, I don't really think this is true journalism. And Alex retorts with, how many former presidents have you interviewed? And Bradley's just worried that she's not this perky personality that that they're after. But Alex isn't concerned with grooming and replacement. She wants a partner. Bradley's also worried that Alex just wants somebody who is happy to be plucked from obscurity. And she says, if you're looking for that... You're going to get extreme buyer's remorse. Alex says, you know, you don't even know me, and I'm getting really sick and tired of people underestimating me. So I want you here at 7 tomorrow. Get up at 5. Get up at 4 the next day. Just condition yourself to be getting up early because you're doing this job. So while Bradley gets a job that she didn't necessarily want, it's now on the production staff to figure out who exactly she is. And they're all sitting around a conference table trying to figure it out. And in walks Alex. And this is the first time that Alex has been in a production room in years. But it's her attempt to be more hands-on. She wants to do the interview with the Mitch accuser, a girl named Ashley Brown. But everybody's still kind of looking at her a little cross-eyed. And finally she addresses the whole room and says, look, I had no idea what was going on with Mitch, all right, but I'm here for you now, so let's get through this together. So while it's great that Alex is preaching team unity, one guy wants to leave. Daniel Henderson storms into Chip's office and says, 
why shouldn't I quit now? Because you promised me that chair, and you basically said it was mine to lose, and nothing's changed between now and that conversation. And Chip cuts him off and says, look, there's a good chance this isn't even going to work out, and there might be two chairs open. So don't quit, because when a chair does open up, it's going to be yours. And Daniel's anger towards the hiring and Chip's trepidation towards the hiring is echoed throughout a lot of the staff, and Bradley feels that. Later that night, Corey takes Bradley to Barney's and opens it up for a private selection, and she's allowed to pick whatever she wants, but she's not really into that. She's like, I'm not here to just act like my favorite movie is Pretty Woman. I mean, I like buying clothes, but uh, honestly, a pantsuit is fine with me. And when she comes out in that pantsuit, Corey actually likes it because he says it reminds him of his mother. And people like his mom haven't had a view of somebody like their own in a while. But she's still worried about the optics of this. She's 40 years old, she's not married, she has no kids, and she doesn't think that the optics of this are going to be good for television, but Corey disagrees. He thinks that she's giving a voice to a lot of women out there. Now on Saturday, the entire production staff is once again assembled, and the big thing on the docket is this interview with the Mitch Accuser. And they just don't feel like Alex is right for the interview. And one of the people that's really banging the drum that Alex isn't right for this interview is Mia Jordan, Bradley's new producer. And it seems like there's a little bit of bad blood between Mia and and Alex. At the end of this meeting, Mia barges into Alex's dressing room, and you come to find out that the reason that Mia was in purgatory, quote-unquote, is because she slept with Mitch. The two had a relationship for a bit, and ever since it ended, she's kind of been pushed to the wayside. But Mia tells her, look, you can do this interview, and it's at the end of the day, it is your call, but it's not going to look good, and you're going to get roasted for it. So Alex reluctantly gives up the interview and says Bradley can interview the Mitch accuser. Now this kind of pisses off Alex, so she leaves, and this pisses off Bradley because the two have yet to rehearse. Bradley's very concerned that the first time they actually are on set is the day of the show. So Bradley runs out and catches Alex right before she's about to take off, and Alex admits, I'm winging this whole thing. I have no idea why I picked you. And Bradley says, you didn't even acknowledge me this entire weekend. To which Alex says, I didn't know I needed to hold your hand. I thought I just needed a partner. And Bradley says, you know, sometimes partners need their hand held. But the two still don't rehearse, and the next day is their first day on set, and Bradley is just standing there, wide-eyed, and Alex comes up behind her and holds her hand. It's a nice moment until Alex says, don't fuck this up. Now, Mitch in this episode has been dropped from his agent. His agent tells him, while we have a great working relationship, you're not going to be working for a while, so I gotta let you go. He also plays tennis at his house with a director, a guy named Dick Lundy, who's also been accused of sexual harassment. And they're having a conversation about how hard it is for guys nowadays, how the two have been railroaded by the media, by past lovers. And Mitch even brings up the idea of doing a documentary with the accusers. But the more he talks to Dick Lundy, the more he realizes that Dick Lundy legitimately is a predator. He was basically doing, like, casting couch type situations. And while Mitch had, in his opinion, consensual sex, this guy was actually soliciting for sex and basically trading roles for dignity. And to Mitch's credit, he calls him on this, but you can tell that it's bothering Mitch that now... Mitch is lumped in with this guy because he doesn't see himself as what Dick Lundy is, a predator. In episode four, the morning show introduces Bradley Jackson to the world and they have this contrived puff piece ready to go with her mom, making it look like Bradley grew up in the perfect childhood home where she cooked with her mom and had just a really good childhood. And it's really just a bunch of BS. And Bradley goes off script and says, you know, it wasn't all happy. We did struggle at times, and it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. And Alex tries to reel her back in, but Bradley says, no, I just want girls out there to know that you don't need this perfect childhood to succeed in life because you can come up from a tough upbringing and thrive. You know, I had problems, and I'm not talking about just being dared to jump off a cliff into a body of water, but I was suspended from school, and I had an abortion at the age of 15. And when she says that, it's like a bomb going off. And she doesn't realize what she's saying until it's too late. And everybody just kind of freezes because it's such a shocking revelation to hear that. They quickly get Yanko Flores on to talk about the weather and really just distract America from what Bradley just said. But Chip and the bosses are freaking out. We're less than five minutes into Bradley Jackson's morning show career and she just revealed that she had an abortion at the age of 15. This is not exactly the way they planned to start this thing out. And to make it even worse, her mother had no idea she had an abortion at the age of 15. And when she wakes up Tuesday, she opens up Twitter, and it's nothing but nasty messages from the pro-life people, and it proves that this story isn't going away. Bradley heads downstairs, and waiting for her is Alex in a car. And when Bradley gets in, she says, is this the part where you take me to the river and shoot me? And she says, no, this is the part where I take you to the studio to get back on that saddle and do this thing again. 
and act like yesterday never even happened. Radley's a little perplexed and says, why do you keep helping me? And Alex is pretty honest and says, I picked you, and I don't want those corporate suits to think that they won. So unfortunately, I have to put up with your crap and maneuver around it because my career's on the line. So Bradley takes the suggestion, goes in, gets back on the saddle, and gives a heartfelt apology that was written on a teleprompter. But after the show, Chip, Alex... Fred and Corey are all meeting about what to do with this Bradley Jackson situation. And Fred wants to take her off of the interview with the Mitch accuser. And Alex says, we're not doing that because we've already run all these ads saying that she's going to be doing the interview. And if we take her off of it, it looks like a reactionary move. And then Corey interjects and says, yeah, look, half the country hates her, but half the country loves her. And if we take her off this interview, then the leftists that love her are going to now hate us because now we're the bad guy because we took her off the interview. So by taking her off of it, we're literally alienating everybody. So we might as well just keep her on. So it's decided that Bradley will stick with the interview. But Chip and the morning show team have another issue because after this meeting, an investigator has arrived and she's going to go around and interview everybody on the morning show to figure out what the systematic problem is that allowed Mitch Kessler to get away with sexual harassment for so long. Before her interview, Chip goes to me and says, look, we got to kind of take one for the team here. Don't bury the company because of her past relationship with Mitch. And obviously Mia had a relationship with Mitch, consensual. But you come to find out that it started off with flirting. Then it moved into Mitch talking about his failed marriage and how there was really no sex life. And then it moved into consensual sex. But eventually Mia called it off. And the investigator thinks that Mia is the one who tipped off the Mitch story to the New York Times. And the investigator says, I just figured that you would be the one to tip off to the New York Times because you're the one who went to HR about Mitch. And she says, I went to HR about Mitch because I was sick of seeing him stand up there and talk about the Me Too movement, acting all sincere when he clearly wasn't. So while we still don't know who tipped off the New York Times, we now know that Mia was the one who tipped off HR. So while Mia was able to open up to the investigator, everybody else is on edge. No one more so, though, than Yanko Flores, who is dating Claire, a younger PA. And to those that don't know their relationship, it looks a lot like the Mitch Kessler situation. Older guy dating a younger girl underneath him in the pecking order of the company. So he is extremely stressed out. And that night he's sitting there with Claire and he asks her, am I doing the stuff to you that Mitch did to these girls? And she says, no, if anything, if anything, the power difference in this relationship is on my side, because while my father has never watched our show, he's powerful enough to make one phone call and get you fired. So if anybody's taking advantage of anybody here, it's me taking advantage of you. And while this is a nice sentiment, it still doesn't put Yanko's mind at ease. On Wednesday, a little bit of the heat from the Bradley Jackson announcing that she had an abortion at the age of 14 has worn off, and America is starting to positively respond to Bradley Jackson. She comes off as uniquely human in a field that has a ton of robots. At one point, she's reading off a teleprompter, and she's supposed to say young adult, but they don't type out young adult. They type out YA. So she literally says, yeah. And people seem to like that she can make mistakes. Now, while some of the heat has worn off, not all of it. There are still protesters outside protesting that she's hired. But the one thing that's changed is now there are protesters that are protesting those protesters that are supporting Bradley Jackson. And this story has gone viral all throughout the country to the point where in Mississippi, high schoolers are walking out of high school, boycotting school for six hours because there's only one abortion clinic left in Mississippi and it takes about six hours to get there. And when the governor of Mississippi made some offhanded comment about Bradley to help his political campaign, it completely backfired because people liked the fact that Bradley was honest. So in a way, this announcement has helped Bradley because while it alienated some people and it lost some sponsors, it got a lot of people's eyeballs on the show and it's picked up a lot of traction for the morning show. So much so that they're seeing ratings boosts that they haven't seen in years. And on Thursday, when the morning show has Kelly Clarkson perform her new song, Kelly Clarkson makes mention that she stands with Bradley and she loves Bradley Jackson. So the support for Bradley is rolling on into her Friday interview with the Mitch Accuser. And before the show on Friday, Bradley's sitting in her office prepping and Corey walks in and says, it's kind of weird being in here, right? This is where it all went down with Mitch. And she says, yeah, it's a little weird. And he says, I just wonder who knew. And that's the problem because no one's talking. Everybody's acting like Mitch was this saint, great guy, but nobody's saying they knew anything. At the moment, though, Bradley really doesn't care because while she's prepping, she has a problem. She feels like all the questions are softball questions. She feels like she's pushing this agenda for the company and protecting the company because the story they're planning on putting out there is that they had a flirtatious relationship, Mitch took it too far, and then she felt the pressure and she quit. And it's just hard to figure that that would lead to somebody quitting. And Mia says, yeah, you're doing a favor for the company, but don't get it twisted. This is a good, hard interview. So Bradley starts interviewing Ashley Brown, the Mitch accuser, and she starts throwing out the softball questions questions and 
Ashley, as you can understand it, would be very reluctant to give any more details than she has to. And because of the fact she's not getting Ashley to open up, she decides to go off script. She asks her, why didn't you go to HR? Did you not think this was a safe work environment? And Ashley mentions that there was an incident, and while she's interviewing her, everybody in the control room is yelling at Bradley to get back on track. Except for Corey, who's continuing to tell her to go on and push forward. Literally. Everybody's pissed off except Corey. Alex is so pissed off, she comes on the stage and just stares her down. But Alex mean mugging her isn't going to deter her, and she keeps pushing on through the interview, trying to get Ashley to open up, and finally, she does. Ashley reveals that she would go into Mitch's dressing room and blow him. And while she never told HR or never told anybody in the office, everybody knew what was going on. And because of what happened, everybody was kind of looking down on her. And what Mitch took from her was her dignity. And after a while, Ashley just didn't recognize the person who she became. And it is a really good interview, and Bradley certainly gets the most out of it, but when she comes off set... Alex is waiting for her and is livid. Alex says to her, I gave you this platform, but Bradley cuts her off and just says, did you know? And Alex is a little confused and says, what? And Bradley says, did you know about Mitch? And Alex looks her in the eyes and says, how dare you? And then storms off. Episode 5 starts out with the aftermath from Brandy's interview. Alex is very pissed off and tells her to never question her integrity again, while Chip wants to get a meeting with her to talk about not sabotaging her own career. But that meeting comes quickly to an end when he finds out that Mitch is back in the building and demanding to talk to the staff. Chip advises Mitch to leave, but Mitch doesn't want to and says, I've worked with these people for years, I need to address them. But the real reason why he's shown up is because there's a New York Times article that's about to come out. It's going to be pretty damning for Mitch, and he wants his former co-workers to come forward and defend him. And for whatever reason, Mitch is allowed to address the room, and it goes about as well as you'd think. Mitch is an emotional roller coaster, screaming one minute, but telling them that he loves them the next. And he's really just searching out somebody that will be the first one to raise their hand and say, I'll go on the record, but no one's doing it. His latch-ditch effort is to plead to Alex, his former co-anchor, but she just walks out of the room, and at this point, security's had enough, and they escort him out of the building. As he's heading into the elevator, Brandy runs in and introduces herself to Mitch and asks who knew. To which Mitch just slyly turns around and says, what do you think? And then gives her a piece of advice, watch your back. So while Brandy ponders what Mitch said, she heads out for coffee and she runs into Hannah and Claire. And Hannah and Claire invite her out for a birthday party that night, expecting her not to show up because she's kind of a celebrity. But to their surprise, Brandy says, yeah, she'd love to come because she doesn't really know anybody in New York. She doesn't have a lot of friends. And on top of it, her co-host, Alex, didn't invite her to this fancy charity event that she's having at her house. So Brandy's schedule is wide open for that night. But that party is tomorrow, and before she can go out and celebrate with her coworkers, she has to do an interview with a journalist named Maggie, who really covers the entertainment industry for one of the publications. And Maggie's doing an expose on Brandy, who Brandy is, where she came from, and her rise to stardom. But she's also poking around about Alex and about Mitch, obviously. And she's a very good journalist, trying to get Brandy in a little bit of a hot water situation, but she's not taking the bait. But luckily for Brandy, most people in the office don't even care about that article. Most people care about the New York Times article that's coming out. The New York Times is called the UBA office and are on a conference call with Corey, Fred, and their lawyer. And since the Ashley Brown interview aired, four more women have come forward and the New York Times want a quote. But UBA wants to know what these quotes are before they themselves give a quote. And after a little bit of haggling, you learn that there's women accusing Mitch of coming onto them in bathrooms, visits to their homes. We're talking, you name it, he's accused of doing it. And then Cherry on top is a very damning quote from his former assistant. So Corey and Fred tried to switch out that damning quote for the story that Mitch had to be escorted off the premises of the morning show. But the Times doesn't bite and they say, we'll run the story as is. Which leaves Fred irate. He turns to the lawyer and says, you better fix this or you're going to find a new job. And then he turns his wrath on a Corey and says, you know, nobody likes you. And what really pisses off Fred is Corey's laissez-faire attitude towards this whole situation. Corey never seems to get flustered. And he never seems to see the severity of the situation. He's just very casual with everything. And it pisses off Fred even more. Now, one of the guys that wasn't on this conference call that probably should have been was Chip, the executive producer. And Chip finds out about this conversation between Corey, Fred, the lawyers, and the New York Times because he meets with a New York Times reporter who wrote the story. And during their meeting, you find out that Chip was actually the source of the Mitch allegations that were leaked to the New York Times. And he's meeting with this guy because he wants to find out if he's going to be railroaded in this New York Times article. Apparently Chip kind of got this guy the job and Chip feels like he owes him that much but the guy's not giving up the information and Chip is now worried that he's going to lose his job. So Chip gets bombed and heads over to Alex's house 
where she's hosting that upper crusty charity event that Brandy wasn't invited to. But one coworker who was invited to the event is Daniel Henderson, and he's being scouted by the competition. Audra, who is truly at this event for political purposes, and is Alex's rival, is at this event trying to tell Daniel that he's being underutilized at the morning show, and he really should come over and work for them. He's telling her that he's happy for the moment, but also the event is teeming with UBA executives, and this isn't the best place to talk. And there are some pretty important people at this event, including Corey and Fred. Now, obviously, Corey and Alex don't have the best relationship, and Corey jokes that he was only invited for political purposes. But just because he's hated by Alex doesn't mean Corey's not going to have a good time. And how could you not at this charity event that's really a bullshit charity with a very exciting silent auction like that's never been done before? And if you pay $1,000, you, yes you, get to sing show tunes. This is the definition of the 1%. But Alex really doesn't care about talking to Corey or singing show tunes. She's waiting for Maggie, the journalist who was interviewing Brandy, to show up to try to poke and prod her for information on the Brandy interview. And when she does, Alex is trying to tell her off the record, but really it's on the record, that Alex was the one who discovered Brandy. And it was Alex who actually saw what's best for the show, but Maggie sees right through this trying to trade information act. And Maggie takes a shot saying that, you know, it seems like you're kind of worried that you're going to be forgotten in this whole thing because now your replacement's here. And this really pisses off Alex, and she says, well, off the record, I'm never never going to be replaced and I'm never going to be forgotten in any room whatsoever. So Chip showing up drunk with a bunch of UBA executives, his coworkers, his peers and a journalist, not ideal. And Chip walks right up to Fred and says, I don't appreciate not being on that conference call, but Fred says, you weren't needed. And Chip says, I know how this works, right? The report from the New York Times comes out, and if it's damning, I'm not going to have a job, and you're going to put the blame on me. And Fred doesn't say anything. He just walks off. And then Chip looks at Corey and says, I just want to let you know, you're just as expendable as I am in this whole situation. And at this point, Corey's just looking for anybody else to talk to. So he sees Alex and books it over there and says, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk since you announced Brandy as the co-host of the morning show. And the last time we talked, it wasn't a good talk, and I was pretty mean to you telling you that we bought you that award. But I got to tell you that you were right. Hiring Brandy was the right move, and I know you don't trust me, but I feel like you're an evil genius, and I like to work with evil geniuses, and I want to work with you. And her only response to this is to tell him to go fuck himself. And he says, you still don't have faith in me, do you? So he dips into his wallet, pays $1,000, and starts singing show tunes, because that's the way to win over a coworker. While singing a song that the two alluded to previously in the show, you can tell that something's spooky, Alex. And as soon as it's over, she books it out of there. She leaves her husband at her own charity event to schmooze with her coworkers, but she's got to get out. She's got to leave. And he, of course, wants to know where she's going. And finally, she says, I'm going to see Mitch. He's my friend, and I have to talk to him, and I need you not to make a big thing out of this, but I'm going to see Mitch. And this gives you a pretty good look as to why these two are currently separated. And as soon as she leaves, Fred gets a call from the New York Times agreeing to take out that damning quote for the story that Mitch was escorted out of the UBA office. But Alex is now with Mitch driving around, and you can tell the chemistry these two have. They're driving around, they're laughing, they're talking about the good old days. And eventually Mitch pulls over the car and says, look, you're not with your husband and I'm not with my wife, and this is the perfect time to get together. And Mitch is half joking, but half serious. One of those, like, he's trying to kind of gauge the room. Alex just laughs, though, and says, yeah, this is just what I need. I need to be with a sexual predator at the moment. But the two end up kissing, and it's only stopped because they get an alert on their phone that the New York Times article is dropped. And it's pretty bad. Now, while that party was going on, Brandy is headed off to meet with her coworkers in a bar downtown. And when she walks in, she starts flirting with the bartender a little bit, but then she finally finds her party, and everybody's shocked she even showed up. And at first, the conversation is fun and jovial, but then it turns into sexual harassment allegations. And to make matters worse, everybody's a little drunk. And when Mitch gets brought up, Mia and Claire kind of go at it, and the conversation gets pretty heated because Mia, unbeknownst to a lot of the people, was very close to the situation. Eventually, it ends with apologies, but the situation definitely got awkward and Mia ends up leaving for the night but when she does that's when they get the alert that the New York Times article is dropped and all the girls are sitting there reading the story and while she's reading it Brandy gets a call from her dad and she had gotten a call from her dad earlier in the show but she ignored it and she decides to call him back and these two haven't spoken in 15 years these two don't have a relationship at all but he's calling to tell her that he's proud of her she starts crying hearing this but she says you can't call me again you, you can't do this and she hangs up the phone and heads back inside she ends up fucking the bartender that she was flirting with earlier and then staggers back to her hotel room where she runs into Corey who ends up escorting her up to her hotel room but at this point, everybody in town has read the story, including Mitch Kessler. And Mitch is incensed by one quote from Fred. 
He'll never work in this town again. So Mitch calls up Fred and says, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. In episode six, the morning show is heading out to California to cover the California wildfires that were alluded to in episode five. Fred, who ironically is having to flee his home because of the California wildfires, has made the decision to send the morning show out there because all the competition's out there and he thinks the optics would be good. But no one really seems to want to go. Especially Alex, who right before she leaves has an argument with her husband who finally asks for divorce. And then there's Bradley, who wakes up hungover in Corey's hotel room, but nothing happened. He really just kept an eye on her. And all three of them separately head to the airport to get to California. And Alex is still treating Bradley like a complete and total bitch. But at this point, it has more to do with Alex's personal life than anything Bradley could actually do. And when they arrive in California, the team immediately starts going through stories they can cover. And they decide they're going to end the show with a guy who's saving puppies. But Bradley doesn't want to do that because she thinks it's a weak story to end on. And when Bradley suggests a harder story, Alex snaps back at her. Is this going to be every day with you? We're morning TV. We want people to feel happy at the end of the show. We don't want people slitting their wrists. And the story that Bradley wants to cover is the fact that rich people are hiring their own fire fighting teams to combat the blaze where the poor just have to watch their homes burn and it's an interesting story so chip interjects and says okay we'll look more into that story for you bradley but for the moment we're going to end the show with the guy saving puppies after the production meeting chip heads over to have a meeting of his own with Corey ellison who's covering uba's entertainment department for the day and chip says that he feels like at this point they're in a mob family and the don is coming for him but Chip has connections to get him out of that job if Corey wants it. And Corey says, yeah, I've thought about it, but we need a story to come out that would make him look pretty bad. And right now, I don't know what that story is. And Chip says, yeah, I wonder what it would be. And Corey says, yeah, I wonder what it would be. And Corey's basically putting this in Chip's hands that if you want to keep your job because you're scared of what Fred might do, then you need to go find that story that makes Fred look really bad. That night, as the team continues to prep, Claire comes into Bradley's trailer, and Claire is the one who found the story on the firefighters being privatized by rich communities. And Bradley absolutely loves that story and tells her, you know, I'm interviewing possible assistants, and I think you'd be great for the job, and offers it to her. And it's a great fit because Claire has loved Bradley's energy from the moment she started on the morning show. And Claire is over the moon with excitement and wants to share it with her boyfriend, Yanko Flores, and while Yanko is proud of her, he doesn't want to be seen this close to her because of still the Mitch Kessler allegations. The next day, the morning show is going to kick off their first episode from the California wildfires. And right before they go to air, Bradley tries to talk to Alex, but Alex cuts her off and says, look, let's get something clear. You don't like me and I don't like you. And all we have to do is work together for two hours a day. And then after that, we just have to act like civilized adults. And on screen, the two look fine, but off the screen, it's the exact opposite. And the main reason why is because Alex continues to treat Bradley like shit, but has nothing to do with anything Bradley's doing. It really is Alex's personal life. And more specifically, her relationship with her own daughter. When they're not filming for the morning show, she's looking at pictures of her daughter, and she's tearing up. And she's blaming it on the smoke, but it's not the smoke. She's in a very fragile state. And at the end of the episode, they do that segment with the guy saving dogs, And he mentions his family, and that hits an emotional chord. And then he brings up the dog who he saved and that you don't want to break up a family because the dog had puppies. And Alice completely loses it. I mean, she's having a breakdown on camera to the point where Bradley actually has to finish this interview. And since this never happened before, everybody in the morning show is pretty concerned about Alex. Alex goes and hides in her trailer, and Bradley goes after her. And at first, Alex is pretty rude to Bradley, but then she starts throwing up, and Bradley starts holding her hair back. And as soon as she's done puking, she yells and snaps at Bradley that you got your show now leave so Bradley does what she's told and leaves the trailer and looks at Chip and says she'll do the next segment but after that I have no idea so Chip tries his hand at calming down Alex and when he goes in there he's met with a little bit of a friendlier face than the one that Bradley got and Alice confides in Chip that she's getting a divorce And really, that's the main reason of why she's so upset. So it seems like this talk has done some good and the show is back on track. After the conversation, Chip is heading back to his trailer when he gets a call from Fred, who is demanding to know why UBA and specifically morning show assistants are poking around to his privatized firefighters. Because Fred is one of those rich people who privatized the firefighting community to try to save his home. And Chip lets him know that when they started poking around for that story, they had no idea that Fred was one of the guilty parties. But Fred is pissed and he wants this story killed. 
So now Chip is in between a rock and a hard place because he's being strong-armed by the president of the company to kill the story that he actually wants to run. He meets with Bradley later that night and says, I'm sorry, I don't want to kill your story. I used to be you. I used to push for hard stories. But unfortunately, this is the president of the company, and I kind of have to toe the company line. And they have a nice conversation, but it's immediately interrupted by somebody coming into the bar they're at and saying, the winds have shifted, we have to pack up and get everybody out of here. Because the fire is headed in their direction. Right before Chip leaves, he turns to Bradley and says, you know what, what if we just said fuck Fred and ran the story? Would you be ready? And Bradley says, absolutely, I'd be ready. So that's exactly what they do. They end up running this story, and at the end of it, Chip calls Corey and says, I think I'm ready to talk about that story that you wanted. That night, Bradley is sitting in her hotel room, and she gets a knock at the door. And to her surprise, it's Alex. Alex apologizes for the way she's been treating Bradley and comes clean to the source of it that it's really her divorce that's eating at her. Bradley tells her that she doesn't have to be this closed off with her. She can be open. She can be vulnerable. And that's when Bradley opens up about her relationship and her family dynamic with her mother. And how her dad actually killed somebody when he was driving drunk. So nobody's family is perfect. And we all have our crosses to bear. But Bradley wasn't the only one getting company that night. Because Claire still wants to celebrate her promotion with her boyfriend Yanko Flores. But when Claire walks into Yanko's hotel room, unbeknownst to them, they're caught by Hannah, the lead booker, who throughout the whole episode has been popping Adderall like a stressed out freshman at Harvard. The episode ends with Bradley reading an email from of all people, Mitch Kessler, who tells her, I think I have something that you might be interested in. The group has returned from California in episode 7, and Chip tells Corey of his plan to get Fred out of the job. He says while he doesn't have all this concrete proof, he's got a bunch of emails on where there's smoke, there's fire, and his plan is to leak it to the media and have them dig deeper to find out the real truth. And Corey tells him, if you're going to do this publicly, you better make sure that the stuff that you have is going to take him down, because Fred has been in this situation before, and if you do this publicly and it doesn't work out, you're going to lose your job. And Corey has good reason to give this warning to Chip because Fred is, in fact, looking to get Chip fired for the Mitch allegations. He's looking to pin all of this on Chip. Fred is looking to let Chip go after the, quote, internal investigation comes out and has gone so far as to put a meeting on the books with Corey and another executive producer that he knows. So Fred's planning on letting Chip go. But while Chip and Corey were meeting that night, Bradley and Mitch are meeting. Mitch is willing to show her where the bodies are buried, tell her everybody who knew. But what he wants in return is an interview. He wants Bradley to interview him on the morning show to get his side of the story out. And initially, Bradley has no interest in this. She tells him, one, they're never going to go for it. But two, I don't want you to be exonerated for this. And he says, well, the ratings would be great. You're going to get your views. It's a great story. Seems like a win-win for both parties. And on top of it, I think I can get somebody to corroborate my story. It's somebody that I slept with and it helped their career considerably and they don't hate me for it and they would back up everything I said. So let me know if you want to do this story because I'm going public with it with somebody and it might as well be you. And what's really concerning Bradley is that this story would take down the entire show. So she's going to let Mitch know but she's battling with it back and forth if she wants to do it or not. And then there's the matter of Alex who that night while people were planning interviews and coups She was busy telling her daughter, along with her future ex-husband, that they were getting a divorce, and the daughter does not take it well. Daughter sides with the husband, saying that this family has taken a backseat to your career, and you've been extremely selfish throughout this whole ordeal. And Alex takes this really hard, because she truly does love her daughter. And the next day, right before the show, Bradley steps into Alex's dressing room and just wants to check on her, and Alex tells her that they let their daughter know that they were getting a divorce. And this is just Alex heeding Bradley's advice to be more open with her. But they have to get ready to do a show and in the control room Mia, Chip and another producer are arguing about what the last story should be and the other producer wants to do it on climate change but Mia wants to do it on this abusive coach and the younger producer is getting really uptight about this and really defensive to the point where Mia says you got to stop talking to him like that Chip's your boss to which he responds with well then he's your boss too so why don't you get your lips off of his ass I mean after all it's what you do best and as soon as he says it the entire control room kind of stops And he apologizes because he knew that he crossed the line. And even though Mia says it's fine, let's just move on, Chip says, no, it's not fine. Pack your shit and get out of here. You're fired. The kid goes, are you serious? I just told her to her face what we've been saying behind her back for the past 18 months. Chip says, yeah, no, I'm serious. Get the fuck out. You're fired. As soon as they go to break, Chip heads into his office and Mia is right behind him. Mia demands that Chip hire him back and says, you have to hire him back. Do you think this is helping me? 
I know how everybody looks at me, but you have to hire him back. And Chip, who is clearly dealing with a lot of stress, says, I shouldn't be punished for this. I'm not the one who fucked Mitch. And I'm as stressed out as anybody about this whole situation. Mia just ends up walking out very annoyed, but it gives you an idea of what she has to go through with her coworkers. After the show, Chip meets with Maggie Ellison, the expose reporter who is doing a story on Bradley Jackson. This is the same reporter who interviewed Bradley Jackson and who is kind of working that page six angle. So she's interviewing Chip about Bradley Jackson, and he's surprised because she doesn't ask anything about the Mitch Kessler allegations. And Chip wants to give her this information, so finally he comes right out and says, I have the names that you want. I have the people who knew. But Maggie's a little thrown off by this, and she says, you've always been a good soldier. Why, why are you doing this? And he tries to get her to bite by saying this is a good story, and she agrees. And she says, this is a good story, but the real story is, why are you bringing it to me? So she's very hesitant to take this bait. So while Chip is trying to talk to a reporter about a former anchor, he's about to lose a current anchor of his. Because Daniel Henderson has decided to meet with Audra and the competition. And what he tells her is that when he was courted to go to the morning show, he was brought there with the assumption that he would be able to do news. And now he's doing the twist. So he's worried that if he would go to the competition, it would be much of the same. So he's worried it would be a lateral move. Audra's doing everything in her power to get Daniel Henderson over to her side, even playing the race angle, but he's just worried about making the switch. But this quick meeting has to end because all of the anchors need to head back to the office to do a photo shoot for publicity purposes. And during the photo shoot, Alex tells Bradley that she's going to have to announce on the air that she's getting a divorce. And her lawyers have let her know that it's going to be awkward and painful, but also the fact that she's probably not going to come off that well when she announces it. And unfortunately, because she's a celebrity, it can't just be simply that two people fell out of love. There's got to be a story and a backstory behind it. But she sees this as an opportunity because Bradley is thought of as so, quote, real. So she invites Bradley over later that night for dinner at her house to discuss it. Now, while this is going on, Mia is in the control room just trying to get some work done. And one of the workers in the control room chastises her for the kid getting fired. She reminds him that she's not the one who got him fired and she didn't want him to get fired, but he doesn't back up. To the point where somebody else in the control room has to tell him to drop it. And Mia gets up to leave and he says, I'll drop it, but some people won't. And that's when Mia has had enough. She grabs the microphone and makes a plea to everybody in the office. That to everybody, she's simply going to be that slut who slept with Mitch Kessler to get ahead in her career. But the fact is, we've all made mistakes, and I just want to get back to work. And you shouldn't judge me for this one action, because all I want to do is work and move on with my fucking life. And not be remembered as the person who fucked Mitch Kessler. Bradley immediately goes after Mia to see if she's okay, and Mia apologizes for not telling Bradley about her past relationship with Mitch. But Bradley says, no, I I'm, I'm glad you said what you said, and I'm just sorry that you had to go through this. And not only that, but you had to go through it alone. Alone. And Bradley's kind words really do put Mia at ease. But Mia's plea to her coworkers couldn't have come at a worse time for Claire and Yanko, who are heading to HR to let them know about their relationship. They didn't really have a choice, though, because somebody in the office reported the relationship, and it's a very stressful interview for both parties involved. And much like Alex with her divorce, that it can't just simply be a divorce, it's the same thing with Claire and Yanko's relationship. It can't just simply be that they're in a relationship, because they're getting questioned on who came on to who, was anybody pressured, is there an abuse of power, when was the first time you guys had sex? Very intrusive stuff. And the HR person really isn't helping them out because everything they say, the HR person's coming back with, well, I didn't say that. You're saying that. And you're the one implying this. And Yanko's worried about being the next Mitch Kessler while Claire's worried about being labeled as someone who's fucking her way to the top. When the reality is they're two consenting adults that are in a relationship. But while that relationship is trying to get off the ground floor, Alex's relationship is obviously ending. So she heads to her daughter's dorm room to smooth things over with her because of the fact that her daughter was so upset when they announced to her that they were getting a divorce. And she's brought pizza as a peace offering, and she's just trying to explain her situation. They were two people who were in love, but they fell out of love. And this has nothing to do with Mitch Kessler. We're simply just two people getting a divorce. But the daughter doesn't want to hear any of this, and she's being extremely rude to Alex. It gets to the point where their daughter yells, just, you know what, get out and leave. And Alex obliges and says, fine, I'll leave if you want me to. And as she's leaving, her daughter says, you know, and you're just going to go off and tell America about this whole situation, aren't you? And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Alex. She turns around and tells her daughter, fuck you. You think you know everything, but you don't. I shouldn't be punished for wanting a career and for wanting something of myself. And you think you have it all figured out. Well, then you go out and you make your dreams come true and you figure out how easy it is. You know, I sacrificed a lot for you and you're sitting here and judging me. And the fact is, I got tired of your father treating me like I was a five-year-old. And the conversation eventually ends with a pair of fuck yous and Alex grabbed the police and storms out. And the real tragedy in this whole situation is, 
She got a full pizza and she throws it out. And there's two girls just sitting there watching this go down. And I'm sure they were hungry because they're college students. It's just a waste of a good pizza. But then this episode comes full circle because Bradley has decided that she will agree to Mitch's terms. And if he can get someone to cooperate the story, she will push for an interview. So Mitch says, okay, he gets in his car and he heads into town. But the person he meets with is shockingly Hannah the Booker. And Hannah says, Mitch, what are you doing here? And he says, well, you got something out of me. And now it's time I get something out of you. The entirety of episode 8 takes place two years before all of the allegations of Mitch Kessler come to light. It's his 50th birthday, he's king of the world, and sure, he makes some inappropriate jokes here and there, but nobody really takes it to heart, and it's just kind of playful banter. That day's morning show needs a political guest, and the head booker at the time, a guy named Jared, has just gotten lazy and complacent with his job. Now, Hannah is a junior booker who knows a political guest and ends up getting the morning show that political guest they needed. Mitch Kessler takes note of this, but he also takes note that Hannah is gorgeous. So they get the political guest on, Mitch is impressed, and the show goes off without a hitch. But that night, they're going to be celebrating Mitch's 50th birthday, and as him and his wife are heading to the party, which is supposed to be a surprise party, but Mitch knows that's going on. Mitch's latest affair pops up in conversation. This gives you an idea that this isn't a first time for Mitch Kessler, but his wife refuses to let it ruin her night and the conversation dies down. They head into this not so surprise surprise party that's been put together by his friend director Dick Lundy. And if you remember from previous episodes, Dick has also been under the fire of sexual assault allegations. Although much like Mitch, because this is two years before all that comes to light, he's also king of the world, happy as a clam. So Mitch walks into this party, he acts surprised, he receives his gifts, and everybody seems to be having a great time. They're drinking lots of alcohol, sharing stories. And over in the corner, Fred and the former head of the news department are having a conversation about Alex and how her approval ratings are so far down that she's being taken off the Major League Baseball's playoffs. And she's been a staple on the playoffs for years now, so this is a pretty big deal. They're replacing her with Mitch. They're also raving about this hot shot from entertainment named Corey Ellison. So this is a precursor of Corey taking over that job. As the night dies down, though, Hannah looks at her phone and sees that there's been a shooting in Las Vegas and the morning show needs to get out there. Now, obviously, Mitch and Alex will be heading out there, but they're looking for their head booker, Jared, and he's nowhere to be found. So in the spur of the moment, Mitch says, you know what? Jared's gotten lazy. Give me that Hannah girl. Also, take Mia off my team. It's just it's too awkward. So right before they leave, Chip heads over to Mia and tells her that she's going to be taking off Mitch's team. And Mia, of course, takes this as a slight. She thinks she's being punished for breaking things off with Mitch, and of course she is. So then she asks to be put on Alex's team, but Alex has no interest in her. She doesn't want Mitch's sloppy seconds. So Mia, at this point, is a woman without a show. So the morning show flies out to Vegas to cover this shooting, and during this time, you're really able to see the dynamic between Mitch and Alex and how close the two truly were. They flirt with that line of brother-sister but also having a sexual relationship. It's weird at times. You can tell these are two people that really enjoy working with one another. Now, at the end of the night, as Mitch is walking the strip of Las Vegas, he sees Hannah, and Hannah is still shell-shocked by the shooting. So they start walking together, and they're talking about her career and life and the darkness of the world. And Mitch says, you know, there's something that always makes me feel good inside sad times and he invites her up to his room to watch Caddyshack and while Mitch is cracking up Hannah isn't because Hannah can't let go of what she just witnessed Hannah says you know I probably should get going because we both have work tomorrow and Mitch gets up and starts hugging her but that hug turns into a pretty long hug Mitch ends up starting to kiss her a little bit and tells her that he really likes her to which Hannah says well I like you too but you can tell by her face which Mitch can't see by the way that she is extremely uncomfortable the two end up having sex and while she never says the word no You can tell by her face that she didn't want this and had no idea this was coming and had no idea that this is the reason she was being called up to the hotel room. She's experienced a shocking moment in Las Vegas with a shooting and now she's having a traumatic experience in Mitch Kessler's hotel room. And to make matters worse, when everybody goes back to New York, she's kind of walking around in a daze. And when she sees Mitch in the hallway, he just says, Hannah, and keeps his head down never acknowledging exactly what went down in Las Vegas. When he reacts like this, Hannah loses it and heads right up to Fred's office. She barges into his office and says, I have something to tell you. When we went out to Vegas, Mitch Kessler, and then she starts breaking down. She can't even get the words out. And Fred says, you don't need to say anything. You don't need to say anything. Because Fred doesn't want to be culpable in this situation. Fred says, you know, I've heard about you, and you do really good work, and that head booker job, that might be open. Hannah looks shocked and says, is this how it goes? And Fred says, yes. If you do great work, you get promoted. Hannah, looking pretty pissed off, says, okay, so now I'm head booker. And Fred agrees, yep, you're head booker. And you could tell that she is completely disgusted by what is going on. He basically paid her off to shut her up. 
And ironically, this is when the Harvey Weinstein allegations first hit the papers. And as Mitch and Alex watch these allegations roll in, Mitch and Alex are both disgusted by these allegations, but they also don't see the irony that Mitch Kessler in this newsroom is basically Harvey Weinstein. Episode 9 takes place right after Episode 7 with Mitch standing outside of Hannah's apartment. And he wants Hannah to corroborate his story. But his story is a little different than her story. Because the way he sees it, she used him, had sex with him to get a better job on the show. So he says, look, let me know one way or another, but your story's going to get told and I'd like you to be a part of it. Now at the same time that Mitch is meeting with Hannah, Bradley and Alex are having dinner to figure out how they're going to play this whole divorce thing. And during the conversation, Bradley ends up springing this Mitch interview on Alex and Alex loses her shit. She tells Bradley she's getting played, she wants to know why Bradley didn't bring it to her in the first place. And this civil conversation ends up turning into a real fight that ends up getting pretty nasty with Bradley just leaving the house. And as soon as Bradley leaves, Alex gets on the phone and demands to have a lunch with Fred. And the next day at that lunch, Alex tells Fred that this whole Bradley thing was a mistake. She tells him that she wasn't thinking clearly when she made this move, but now Bradley's trying to take down the show and that just can't happen. She also tells Fred about the Mitch interview and says that Mitch has information on Fred and that I think the play here is just to simply get rid of Bradley as soon as possible. Now Fred is completely okay with getting rid of Bradley, but he also wants to get rid of Chip. Fred wants to get his guy in there, this guy named Marlon Tate, who he knows. And even though Chip has been Alex's producer for years, and she does feel loyalty to him, she wants Bradley gone so badly that she agrees to meet with Marlon, right after he meets with Corey Ellison, in a you-scratch-my-back-I-scratch-yours situation with Fred. And Alex knows exactly who she wants to replace Bradley with. It's Daniel Henderson. So the plan that she's concocted is that she's going to send Bradley out into the field and have Daniel Henderson fill in for Bradley. And after a while, America will get so used to seeing both of their faces that the announcement will come out that Bradley's true passion is being a field reporter. And while she's telling Daniel this, she does say, hey, keep it hush-hush because I don't want this plan getting out. And this could be the big break that Daniel Henderson's waiting for. So as soon as he gets done with talking to Alex, he heads outside and calls Audra and says, we got to call this whole thing off. I might be a fool right now, but I got to go with the devil that I know. So Daniel Henderson was planning on leaving the morning show. Now, obviously, all of this is going on without Bradley's knowledge, and she's headed to Corey Ellison to pitch him the Mitch interview. And, of course, Corey Ellison loves it. So at this point, you've got Bradley and Corey versus Fred and Alex. Now, Corey and Bradley bring the Mitch interview idea to Chip, who just found out, by the way, from a staffer that his replacement is being vetted by UBA. So he's a little shell-shocked at the moment. So while he's getting pitched this Mitch idea, and everybody knows it would be huge ratings, he's worried that they're using this show as a nuclear bomb. He says maybe he can get Alex to come over to his side, and Corey cuts him off and says, I'm just going to let you know. I'm not the only one meeting with Marlon Tate. Alex is also meeting with him. And when Chip hears this, it puts the fear of God into him because Chip and Alex have been a team forever. And while the stab in the back from Alex hurts, he still isn't sure if he wants to do the Mitch interview. Now, speaking of Mitch, he's trying to figure out exactly how to play his divorce in his New York apartment when he gets a knock at the door and it's Alex. And Alex lets him know, there's no way in hell I'm going to let you come on this show and do an interview. And Mitch says, that's funny because I haven't heard from Bradley yet. And Alex says, I'm just letting you know you're not going to use my show to take down everybody in your warpath. And Mitch looks a little bit puzzled and says, I'm just trying to take down Fred, but this idea that you're not complicit? And Alex immediately says, I'm not. And Mitch starts to crack up and say, you used to make fun of all these people. And you knew everything that was going on. And Alex continues to act like she has no idea what was transpiring. And Mitch once again reassures her that I'm not coming for you, but I'm taking Taking this story to somebody, and how's it going to look if my former home wouldn't take the interview? It's going to look like you guys were staying silent this entire time. Now, this can be big ratings for the show, and it could be big for you. And the reality is, you're going to be fine. You're a woman, and no one cares at this point if women were complicit. Your career is going to be fine. But I'm either going to you, or I'm going to your competitor. And that's exactly what Bradley sees in this that Alex doesn't. Finally, Alex plays her final trump card. She tells him that she's going to have to address her divorce on the air. And everybody's going to think it has to do with the Mitch Kessler situation. But the reality is, working with Mitch Kessler, that's a big shadow. And I remember one time in Chile, you reamed me out for cutting in your segment, and I felt so bad. And I remember feeling so bad that we went out later that night, and I just remember drinks and more drinks and more drinks. And somehow that night, I ended up in your bed, and I just can't figure out how I got there. And Mitch looks completely shell-shocked and just says, you won it. And Alex, stone-faced, says, try me, and walks out of the apartment. So at this point, Mitch 
really needs Hannah to come through. And Hannah is meeting Claire for drinks, and Claire and Yanko are still going through the issue of how to go public. And they're about to embark on their, quote, first public date. And Claire's explaining to Hannah about their relationship, and Hannah says, I just think it's a bad idea, and if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm the one who reported you guys to HR. And of course, Claire gets pissed off and says, you had no right, you have no idea about our relationship, and you didn't even come and ask me about it. And of course, Claire doesn't realize that Hannah's trying to protect her from her first-hand experience of getting used. And even though Claire doesn't think she's being used, and in all honesty, she's not being used, Hannah is trying to protect her. She tells her, you're young, you're talented, and you have your whole life, and you shouldn't be labeled because of who you're dating. But this doesn't calm Claire down. And while she's pissed off at Hannah, and she does go on the first date, the more and more she thinks about it, the more she realized Hannah may have a point. And right before they actually go into the restaurant, she ends up calling off the relationship with Yanko. And Yanko is devastated, and in all honesty, so is Claire, but she's got a career to think about. And she doesn't want to be labeled as somebody who's getting ahead because she's dating somebody with quote-unquote power. But to get back to Hannah, she's agreed to meet with Mitch, but she wants to get her side of it out. She was young and naive and had a light shined on her from the star of the show. And she really thought it meant something when he told her she was talented. And when she went up to that hotel room that night, she had no idea that that was going to happen. And Mitch takes offense to this, saying, You're a booker. Your entire job is to seduce people to come on to the show. You can't get mad because you were seduced. Come on, you're smart. What do you think happens when the star of the show is making $20 million, takes an interest in a junior booker? Come on, you knew what was going on. Either that or you're an idiot. And the most amazing part is Hannah doesn't want anything from this situation. She simply wants Mitch to realize her side of the story, but he's failing to do so. And at this point, she just wants the conversation to be over, so she lets him know she will corroborate the story, but she just wants her name out of it, and she wants him to leave her alone. And finally, we reach the season finale of The Morning Show. Bradley and Chip meet with Mitch to go over the plans of the interview, and they find out that the person corroborating the story is Hannah, and they are disgusted. And they're also very worried that Mitch is going to make himself out to be the victim of this. But Bradley's more concerned with Hannah, because Hannah has no idea that the place she's corroborating a story for is her own show. And Bradley is not willing to do this interview if she doesn't have Hannah's okay. She doesn't want to blindside Hannah with the Mitch Kessler interview. Now, while those two are meeting with with Mitch Kessler, Maggie is meeting with Fred, and she lets him know that she's going to be investigating UBA for the allegations that she's heard about. And Fred is completely blindsided by this and demands that she kill the story because of how much he has done for her in her career. But she refuses. She says, I'm not going to kill the story. This, me letting you know about it, is my courtesy. And as soon as she leaves, he gets on the phone with the people that were handling the internal investigation and says, you better have a report for me on my desk by Tuesday. Because Fred needs a fall guy ASAP, and of course that fall guy is unfortunately going to be Chip. That Monday, as the staff returns to work for the morning show, it's a very hostile work environment because of the backstabbing and the negative energy in the air. But one of the people that hasn't arrived to work yet is Hannah, who's getting a phone call from a Los Angeles number, and when she answers it, it's somebody from UBA offering her a promotion out in LA. And while she's shocked and taken aback, she suddenly gets a text message from Maggie wanting to interview her. And it seems like the two have something to do with one another. And after the show on Monday, Bradley goes to meet with Hannah and lets her know that Mitch Kessler is going to be doing the interview on the morning show. And Bradley wants her side of the story, but Hannah doesn't want to give it. Her feeling is that it's not her job to take down Fred and the company. And Hannah starts to lose a little bit and mentions that she was offered a job, and Bradley says, they're just trying to silence you. But Hannah just wants this thing to go away. So she tells Bradley, whatever you're doing, keep me out of it, and she walks out of the room. So it looks like their interview is dead. But later that day, Bradley gets a text message from Hannah saying she's reconsidered, so Bradley goes to meet with Hannah. And Hannah is telling the whole side of the story, but Bradley keeps pushing and pushing for more, much like she did with the Mitch Kessler accuser earlier this season. But finally, Hannah snaps. She yells at Bradley, I'm not going to be your Ashley Brown. I'm not going to break down for you and have this sob story. I think about this every single day. And the fact that somebody you admire got on top of you and used you, it's ridiculous. But you know what? I'm strong and I'm going to keep going. But it's clear that she's losing it. And Bradley is taken aback by this and realizes she's gone too far and starts to apologize and says, fine, we won't do it. But Hannah says, no, no, no. Do it, but just make sure before you do do it that I've accepted this new job in L.A. before they take it away from me. But over in the office, Chip is extremely stressed out and is freaking out on his staff over the smallest minute details. That is, until he finds out that he has a meeting on the books with Fred for 4 o'clock. And when he finds out about this meeting, he knows what's coming and he starts to revert back on his previous behavior and starts to tell the staff how much he appreciates them. He apologizes and says we've all had a bad day and reminds them that they're the best and 
they're his people, but really, this is Chip's goodbye to them. And before Chip is going to meet with Fred, Fred is actually meeting with Alex, and Alex is trying to save Chip's job, but to no avail. She wants to know why we can't just have this internal investigation come out and put Chip on administrative leave, have Marlon come in for a few weeks, and then transition Chip back into his role. But Fred says, nope, a precedent has to be set. And he's sweetening this deal by letting her know that she'll have co-host approval and more money in her next contract as soon as she okays it. And as soon as she okays it, Marlon is in and Chip is out. So she reluctantly agrees to the deal. And as Chip is going up to meet with Fred, Alex is coming down and she can't even look at him. And that's when Chip truly knows he's done. So because Chip knows that he's going to meet the executioner, he goes in that meeting extremely hostile. Fred tries to put the blame on him and tells him that the internal investigation will be released tomorrow and he's going to be the blame of it. But he's no longer employed by UBA. And then you see that scene in TV shows and movies that never actually happens when a guy rushes out to a busy New York sidewalk doesn't bump into anybody, stands in the middle of it, and just collects his thoughts. But as soon as he does collect his thoughts, he calls Bradley and says, we gotta speed this thing up, because they can't let the internal investigation get out tomorrow, because as soon as it does, he becomes the fall guy, and Fred is off scot-free. So that night, Chip meets with Bradley to figure out how they're going to handle getting Mitch into the studio because Chip no longer is in the control room. And eventually this turns into an argument about everybody's motives, but at the end of the day, they realize they still need to do this interview, no matter what the motives are, and they need to figure out a way to get Mitch in that studio without Marlon and Fred figuring it out. So right before the morning show that morning, Chip meets with his old assistant and lets her know the plan that when Alice goes downstairs to do a segment, the assistant is going to sneak Mitch in the back door and Bradley is going to conduct the interview. And the segment that Alex is doing is never actually going to see the light of day. And all the while, Corey will be in the control room making sure that the camera is pointing at Bradley and not Alex downstairs. So the assistant has her marching orders, she's agreed to it, and she heads off to work. Now, Claire is also headed off to work, but she wants to reconcile with Hannah over how they ended their last conversation. Claire has shown up at Hannah's building, and Hannah, by the way, accepted the position in Los Angeles before she went to bed that night. But unfortunately, she's never going to get to go to Los Angeles because Claire finds out that she overdosed and Hannah is dead. Now, the staff doesn't know yet, and they're standing around listening to Fred, Marlon, and Corey address everybody as to this new regime coming in with Marlon taking over for Chip. And while Fred is addressing everybody, Bradley gets a phone call from Claire, and Claire lets her know that Hannah OD'd last night. So Bradley announces to everybody of what's gone on, and everybody is completely shocked and broken up about Hannah passing away. As Alex is sitting in her dressing room, Bradley comes in and says, hey, I, I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. I can't do this anymore. And Bradley comes clean with Alex about how they were going to do the interview. Alex was going to be downstairs. Mitch was going to come in. Spills the beans on everything, including Hannah and Mitch's relationship. And Alex is blown away because she had no idea that Hannah and Mitch had anything to do with one another. So Bradley storms out of the building, but Alex can't let her leave because she needs her, and she goes after her. She stops her on the street and says, look, you're a shitty person for doing that to me, but I'm such a shitty person that I went to Fred Micklin and tried to get you fired from this place, but you can't blame yourself for what happened with Hannah. And after Alex freaks out on a fan on the sidewalk, Bradley says, look, I'll come back if you just calm down. So both of them head back to work, and Bradley calls Chip and says, we can't do this interview because Hannah's dead. Now, Chip was planning on picking up Mitch that day, and when he sees him, he tells him that we're not doing this interview because Hannah is dead. And the two get into a fist fight in Mitch's lobby. Eventually, the fight subsides, and Chip walks out of the building. And when he does, he calls Alex to let her know that he's the one who tipped off the New York Times to the Mitch allegations because they were planning on getting rid of Alex. And he knew that if they didn't have Mitch, they had to keep Alex. So to protect her, he's the one who leaked the story to the New York Times. Knowing that it would get Mitch fired and knowing that it would force their hand to keep her. And he's just trying to show that he was loyal while she wasn't. But she doesn't get the message because at this point, she's on air. And she is completely flustered. And Marlon, the new producer, comes in. Having never met Hannah, having no idea who Hannah is, says, Hey, let's do this one for Hannah. To which Alex throws water in his face and says, Get the fuck away from me. And when the broadcast actually starts, Alex just starts getting up and walking around aimlessly. And everybody in the control room is thrown off by this behavior. And finally she goes, You know, I have something to say. We haven't been honest here at this news station. Not necessarily with the news. But, you know, this isn't all what it seems. And Bradley looks at her and says, Are we doing this? And Alex says, Yep. And they start coming clean on everything. Everything that's going on with Fred Micklin. Everything that's going on with Mitch. And while this is happening, Marlon is desperately trying to stop the broadcast but Corey is telling him to continue and when Fred gets wind of it he rushes down from his office but 
the staff has locked him out as Bradley and Alex tell the world what happened. And credit to Alex who's taking full responsibility for it, but both of them put the network on blast. But it doesn't last long because eventually the network does shut down the feed. And that is how the first season of The Morning Show wraps up. So thanks, everybody, for watching this or listening to it, if you didn't actually watch it, because it, you, know, you can listen to it. Please subscribe to the channel. I would really, really appreciate it. It helps me eventually one day get paid, since YouTube makes you have 1,000 subscribers before you actually cash in. They're lame like that. So I do appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button. Likes are cool. I don't read the comment section because they're a cesspool. And if you thought this video sucked, by all means, hit the thumbs down. I really don't care. But thanks for listening, and thanks for watching and getting to this point of the video. New station. WVXT. He's got a new girlfriend and he's planning on proposing on New Year's Eve, which I'll tell you right now, she says yes. They always do. Claire also left the show. After finding one of her best friends dead, she decided it wasn't for her. She's currently studying for her GRE. And then there's Corey. Now, Corey was initially fired, with Fred being put on administrative leave. It was something that Corey could not believe, but while the board thought Fred was guilty, they couldn't prove it. What they could prove was the fact that Corey came in and their show kind of went to hell in a handbasket, so they let him go. But he was actually brought back after Bradley threw a conniption fit. So the show picks up eight months after the end of season one. It's New Year's Eve. They've replaced Alex with another anchor named Eric. But while they prepare for their big New Year's show, which will be hosted by Eric and Bradley, the big story that everybody's talking about is the fact that their nighttime anchor, Ray Marcus, has been accused of emotional abuse. So they're going to have to replace Ray. He's been on, quote, vacation, so it's not like UBA didn't know about this, but now that the story's out, it's a pretty big deal. On top of it, Maggie Brenner is writing a book, and it's about everything that's happened in the news industry, and this could possibly be another chapter in it. So Corey ends up getting a team with legal together, along with Mia Jordan, and a new UBA employee named Stella, who seems like she's one step above Mia Jordan. The plan that they have right now is to put Eric on evening news. Now the issue is, who do they pair with Bradley? And their short list is down to two people because the third person they had in mind doesn't want to work with Bradley. Which brings up the elephant in the room, is Bradley cutting it? Her contract is up in a couple months, and ratings are down for the show. Mia poses the question of keeping Eric on the morning show and putting Bradley at nighttime. Mainly because she has this thirst to do actual news stories where a morning show is more puff pieces. Some of the people in the room actually laugh at this idea, because the fact is, Bradley has been kind of a loose cannon, uncoachable. Mia says, I love Bradley, but she needs the polish of a seasoned anchor like Alex to balance her out. And that's when Corey gets the bright idea, well then we'll just get Alex back. But that's going to be easier said than done, because no one's talked to Alex in eight months, and the last time UBA heard from Alex, it was a stern, no, I'm not coming back. And then you've got people like Stella who think that Alex is just flat out cooked. But the fact remains, if Corey wants Alex, he's got his work cut out for him. After his meeting with Mia and Stella and Legal, Corey heads on to focus on the new streaming service they've launched, UBA+. Plus. He's trying to get rights for shows and rights for movies, and it's stressful. But his quest for content gets interrupted when Bradley walks in uninvited. And like a good exec, Corey acts like he is thrilled to see her. And she's shown up to hint at the fact that she would be interested in the nighttime chair. At this point, Bradley feels like she's done her part. She's done a lot of the puff pieces they wanted her to. She even dyed her hair. And Corey kind of owes her one because he'd be out of a job if it wasn't for her going to bat for him. But Corey gives her a lot of fluff. But ultimately, he tells her, I can't move you. Bradley accepts it and even starts to talk herself into staying on the morning show because she feels like her and Eric really complement each other. She feels like her and Eric are a better match than her and Alex. But Corey tells her, well, you and Alex had a good thing there for a little bit. And who knows what would have happened if he kept it going. And Bradley has to admit, yeah, that's true. After Bradley leaves his office, now it's time to find her a partner. And he heads up to Maine, where Alex is very surprised to see him. She's been busy writing a memoir. A memoir that hasn't really got a lot of traction because she won't talk about the Mitch situation. And her agent reminds her, this is why people are going to buy books, because of the Mitch situation. So you need to write about it. But she's hesitant to. She's definitely very surprised, though, when Corey pulls up in his car. And he doesn't sugarcoat it. He just comes right out and says, I need you to come back for a year. Bradley's doing okay, but she's not testing great. Ratings haven't been good. And we're taking Eric for the evening news. Alex asks him, is Bradley upset? And Corey says, well, she will be. And Alex is totally turned off by the fact that they haven't even told Bradley yet. 
He tries to get the conversation, though, back on track, saying that it wouldn't be like before. It would be a whole new deal. Alex will be a big voice in the rebranding of UBA. He tells her, you were all we ever needed and we were too stupid to realize it, so please come back. But she says no. While she agrees with everything that he said, she feels like if she comes back, it'll look a little wishy-washy. And he says no. When your new deal gets announced, you're going to look like a genius. She still, though, says no. He makes one last-ditch effort before he leaves, telling her, just think about it for 24 hours, but it seems like her mind is pretty made up that she doesn't want to come back to UBA. So with Alex saying no, Corey heads back to the UBA office where he meets with Stella, and now they have to go to their plan C or plan D at this point. The next in line is an anchor named Aaron, and Corey tells Stella, just hold off on closing any kind of deal with him. Stella thinks it's because Corey hasn't told Bradley, and that's part of it, but it more so has to do with the fact Corey hasn't given up on Alex. He told her to wait 24 hours, and it definitely has not been 24 hours. And while Corey was busy trying to lure Alex back, Mia was busy putting together the the end-of-the-year montage for 2019. And it's very ironic because she says, man, this year sucked. She has no idea what's waiting for her in 2020. They do agree, though, that they should probably put themselves in the news, but more so with Alex and Bradley's rogue segment than anything else. She ends up running into Bradley when she's doing this, and Bradley thanks her because Bradley knows she can be difficult, and it hasn't always been easy working with her, but Mia's always been there, standing by her, having her back, so she decides to thank her for that. Bradley has to get ready, though, because that night is the big ball drop. As she's hosting with Eric, Corey is stuck in traffic trying to get to the set. While he's doing so, Stella texts him that they're close to closing the deal with Aaron, and he's excited to work with Bradley. But Corey texts her back, just give me an hour. He calls Alex, but he gets her voicemail, so he decides to leave her this 11th hour plea to come back and work with UBA. Back over actually on set, though, Bradley's having the time of her life, but something has been eating Eric up. It's the fact that he's leaving and Bradley doesn't know. He knows he's not supposed to tell her, but he can't hold it from her anymore. He finally comes clean. Bradley, I'm going to the evening news. And Bradley can't believe that it seems like everybody else knew about it except her. She looks like a fool. So she's pretty pissed off. And unfortunately for Corey, when he arrives, he's the first person she sees. She screams at him, you lied to me. You put Eric in the nightly news and apparently everybody knows about it except me. He starts telling her how she needs to trust him because he has her best interest in mind. But she starts screaming back at him. And finally, he kind of has a little bit of a mini breakdown by saying, you know what? This job is hard. I know it doesn't seem like it to you because every time you come into my office, I have a Cheshire Cat grin on my face. But it's an act because when I took over, they didn't give me a Maybach. They gave me a rat with holes in it. And it's my job to fix it. So I'm trying to conjure Noah's Ark out of thin air. And honestly, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it. And honestly, I had hopes that me and you would walk onto that arc together. She kind of looks at him cross-eyed and says, Is this the part where I'm supposed to thank you for giving me my big break? Because I'll remind you, you only have this job because of me. And Corey kind of takes this in and says, Man, you are so certain you know how the world works. It's amazing. You seem to think that your friends, and I'm counting myself in this, but your friends are out to get you. She corrects him, though, saying, We are not friends because all you had to do to be my friend was be honest to me. Turns out, though, you're just a weasel that everybody said you were. And that's when Corey gets real serious and poses the question, did it ever occur to you that I can't tell you everything because you're obsessed with telling the truth and I don't know what's going to leak out? And I also can't tell you how other people feel about you because your ego is too fragile where you go running off and crying. You never seem to process that information into something constructive. This ends with Bradley telling him to go fuck himself and storming off to go watch the ball drop. But back up in Maine... Alex went to a neighbor's New Year's Eve party, and as she was leaving, she saw that she had a missed call from Corey. When she listens to it, she hears that 11th hour plea from him. Corey decided to go with the poetry tactic. And it works. As Bradley and Eric are counting down the ball to being dropped to 2020, Alex ends up calling Corey back. Corey tells her, we want to be in the Alex Levy business no matter what. Look, our deal fell through with Eric's replacement. We're in a bind. You've done the morning show, and you graduated, and you've earned the right to move on. Could you please come back and fill in until you're ready to launch your new primetime show? And Alex is crying and tells Corey, listen, let's talk tomorrow. And Corey excitedly says, Alex, I will call you tomorrow. You will not be sorry, Alex. The last question that she asks him is, Corey, can I trust you? And he says, yes. And at that moment, it's 2020, which you feel bad for him because you know what they're walking into. As soon as he gets off the phone with Alex, he calls Stella and says, 
Kill the deal with Aaron. I'll explain everything tomorrow, but kill it. It's a new year, Stella. Things are looking up. But it doesn't even take one second for that statement to become a freezing cold take. Because as Corey looks up on the ticker in Times Square, he sees that Hannah's family has filed a wrongful death suit against UBA. And that is yet another issue that he's going to have to deal with. Episode 2 picks up right where episode 1 left off, after the New Year's Eve broadcast. Bradley starts walking to her hotel room, but waiting for her in the lobby is Corey, and she wants to breeze right by him, but he says, no, I have to tell you something. You're already mad enough, and this is going to get out, so I'll tell you now face to face. We're bringing Alex back. We're going to get a deal done quickly, and we're going to hammer it out and get her on air as soon as possible. And Bradley doesn't say anything. She only gets pissed off at Corey when he says everything's going to work out, because she starts ripping him for being her boss and not her friend, because she actually thought he was a friend. And right before she gets in the elevator, she tells him, you know, I'm not feeling so well after being outside all day. I think I'm going to call in sick. And three weeks later, she's done that. She's called out sick for three straight weeks. But Bradley is the least of Corey's problems. Even three weeks later, he's got this wrongful death suit to deal with. And as he's talking to legal about what to do, they're proposing that they just hammer this out in court, drag it out, scare Hannah's parents. But Corey says, no, just give them what they want. We already have enough bad press as it is, so just pay them and end it. After legal leaves, he starts working on UBA+, Plus, but Stella walks in because, unannounced, Alex is showing up with her agent. She tried to sneak in covertly, but she does end up getting noticed. She just wants to see her new office, which, by the way, it's huge. Her agent is a little concerned, though. The deal isn't done, and he knows that UBA wants to do a big rollout when they announce this. They don't want this leaking out. So he reminds Alex, if anyone asks, you're just here seeing old coworkers, and that's it. So Alex and her agent are just chilling in this empty office when Corey and Stella walk in. And Corey goes full on exec. I mean, you would have thought he just got laid. He is glowing. Laying it on pretty thick. Stella, on the other hand, is pretty reserved. I mean, it's like yin and yang. Corey ends up mentioning how they can't wait to hear about Alex's ideas for her primetime show. But her agent tells them, well, we'll give you the full pitch once the deal is closed. When they bring up potential producers, he says the exact same thing. We'll discuss it when the deal is closed. One of the UBA employees runs in and interrupts all of them and says, Alex, you got to run down to the studio. But Stella says, don't. And Alex is a little taken aback. And Corey smooths it over by saying, Alex, you're one of the few good things going on for us right now. So we want to keep this under wraps until we tell the world that you're coming back. That's going to be good for you. It's going to be good for us. And it's going to be good for the show. Alex is okay with that, but she does question if her and Bradley should meet about this PR blitz. And Corey suggests that maybe she reach out to Bradley. Alex ends up asking if Bradley's excited and Corey ends up lying and says she's so excited. As they're getting ready to leave, Corey suggests that maybe Alex and Stella get together at his place the next night just to hammer out some details. They all agree it sounds good and Corey ends up leaving them back in the empty office. But right before Alex's agent leaves, she asks, did you get a chance to see an advanced copy of Maggie Brenner's book? And Alex's agent, Doug, tells her, no, they're keeping that pretty tight-lipped, but I wouldn't worry about it. You're going to look fine. And by the way, you have your own book, and if people want the story, they can get it from the horse's mouth. Alex then gets in the elevator to leave, but as she's doing so, she accidentally hits the floor to go to the studio just out of muscle memory. And curiosity gets the better of her, and she starts walking around a little bit, but she starts getting recognized, having a little bit of a panic attack. So she goes in her old dressing room, which just so happens to be Eric's dressing room at the moment. And she goes to leave once she sees that Eric is in there, but he says, no, I insist, stay. She congratulates him on getting nights, and he congratulates her on coming back, but she's a little surprised because nobody's supposed to know that. He then moves the conversation, though, to Bradley, saying, I guess you guys didn't end on the best note. And she says, well, did Bradley tell you that? And Eric says, no, it's just a feeling I got. Alex, though, tells him, no, we're good. And Eric starts poking around on how to get Bradley to talk to him again because Eric still being on the morning show is one of the many reasons why Bradley hasn't come back to work the last three weeks. He asks for some advice, but Alex tells him, I think you would know more. I mean, you've worked with her for... What, six months? He starts complaining about how it's really hard to be a good friend of her, and Alex just stands up and says, where do you get the right? I mean, me and Bradley worked together for three weeks, and it was three difficult weeks, and I'm sure she told you about that if you truly are friends, but if you can't get a hold of her or get through to her after working with her for six months, then maybe you're not friends. Maybe the problem here is you, and then she leaves. As she was leaving, she did end up avoiding both Daniel and Mia. And Mia just went to check on Daniel because he once again got passed over. And not only did he get passed over, but they're bringing in the woman who really screwed him over in the first place, and Alex. But then Daniel starts asking about the coronavirus because the first case in the U.S. just hit. And he thinks that they should devote some time to it. But Mia reminds him it's kind of a depressing topic. There's always 
something going on, and there's a lot of news already that they have to pack into the show. Mia, though, then changes the subject to the dinner at Corey's. Even though Corey wanted it to be intimate, it's not. Pretty much every anchor's been invited at this point, and Daniel doesn't want to go, but he doesn't really have a choice. But Bradley is still holding out, just sitting in a hotel room. She's going out once to get ice cream, but that's it. She needs some suggestion on how to get through to Alex. So she calls the one person that knows Alex better than anybody, Chip. And when she tells Chip that Alex is coming back, he's really surprised. Bradley starts venting to him about the fact that it just feels like they're calling in Bradley's big sister to clean up her mess. And Chip tells her, you know that's not the actual case, right? UBA's been a dumpster fire for a while. But once again, Bradley's called to get some insight on who Alex is. And Chip tells her that Alex can make you feel like you were the most important thing in the world. And then you turn around and she'll push you right off a cliff. And she'll justify it to herself because deep down, Alex is in it for Alex. Alex is extremely competitive. And this is exactly how Chip feels. That Alex made him feel like he was the greatest thing in the world. But then when push came to shove, she pushed him off that cliff. And he vows that if he ever sees her again, he's going to have some choice words for her. She then hangs up the phone and needs to decide if she's going to this dinner tonight, which isn't very far for her to go. It's literally the floor up. Bradley's still on the fence about it. She had a pretty contentious conversation with her agents about going back to work, and she just seems to have stuck her foot in the ground and she's not moving. And one of the reasons why is she feels like she has a lot of leverage in this situation. UBA is about to roll out a big PR blitz with the return of Alex Jackson for Alex and Bradley. She is the Bradley. But her agent warns her, you might have leverage in this situation, but remember... If you squeeze, then the people that you're squeezing are going to remember that. And the first chance they get, they're going to squeeze back harder. But Bradley is really the only question mark that this dinner has. And that's when Corey gets a phone call from Sybil, who's his boss. And she is enraged because Bradley was photographed by page six going out and getting ice cream. And she doesn't look sick at all. She's making UBA look foolish. And Sybil commands Corey to fire her immediately. And Corey doesn't really have a choice. So he just, to get her off the phone, says... Okay, but he's not ready to give up on the Bradley train just yet. He heads downstairs to ask her, are you coming up to this thing? She doesn't really answer them, though, when he asks that question, and he gets tough with her, saying, okay, well, if you are coming, then you need to put your big girl pants on. I know you think you're sticking it to everybody, but in reality, you're only sticking it to yourself. And I know you don't believe this, but I went through a lot of trouble to get Alex back for you, because if you could actually just get the anger out of your way, you'd realize that Alex coming back is good for the show, good for her. More importantly, it's good for you. Because it's going to be incredibly successful. It's going to give you the green light to do all the things you've ever wanted to do, including serious news stories. So, trust me, if you don't make this work for you, you're only screwing yourself. And she comes back with a snarky response, and he just shakes his head and leaves. Because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. But a little while later, to Corey's surprise, Bradley shows up. Bradley and Alex have a super long, super awkward hug. But then they split up. Bradley starts talking to Mia about her, quote, sickness. And Alex goes to talk to Daniel because Daniel was really the only person in the room who was cold to her when she showed up, and Alex knows why. Alex tries to apologize, saying she's a different person now, but the damage is done as far as Daniel's concerned. He tells her, I turned down co-anchor at YDA because we made an agreement. And even though Alex didn't know that, the very next morning, Alex decided to go on an impromptu crusade with the woman that she was supposed to be firing. And while Daniel's glad that Alex said what she said about Fred, he's pissed off because He didn't want to be the collateral damage because of it. Alex realizes that she really hurt Daniel and tells him, anything I can do to help you move forward, I will do it. You deserve a lot better than you've gotten. But I can't turn back time. All I can promise that I can do is better. But Daniel says, apology not accepted and walks off. Good news for Alex, though. She doesn't have to sit next to him at dinner. Bad news is... She has to sit next to Bradley. Since they do work at a news station, news conversations start popping up. Most people are downplaying the coronavirus, just saying, and this is going to shock you out there, quote, it's nothing worse than the flu. Daniel, though, keeps saying, I don't think we should joke about this. I mean, people are really getting sick, and someone should cover it. Alex, who is trying to be better, says, well, then let's get you on a plane. But Daniel was planning on going to Iowa for the caucus, and Alex volunteers Bradley to do it because of the fact that she likes serious news stories. But Bradley somehow gets offended by the fact that Alex volunteered her to do something that she would actually want to do. Daniel, though, gets the conversation back on track by saying, I'm not saying that I need to cover coronavirus. I'm saying that we as a station need to start covering the coronavirus. And Stella reminds everybody that a disease spreading isn't exactly compelling TV. Boy, will she be wrong in a few months. And then leave it to the weatherman who comes in hot like a heat wave. We just need to get this sham of an impeachment trial over. Corey can kind of tell that he probably should break this up before there's an all-out brawl, so he makes a toast to the return of Alex and the return of Alex and Bradley, 
laying out their entire PR blitz, which is a lot. After dinner, though, Alex feels like Bradley's being a little standoffish. So she walks up to her and asks her, is everything okay? And Bradley tells her yes, but it's not believable. And when Alex suggests that they get together, Bradley says, yeah, contact my assistant. So there's two people that Alex is going to need to mend some fences with. She ends up heading out, but as she's walking to the elevator, Bradley chases after her. And the two women have it out right there in the hallway. Bradley telling Alex that since she's been gone, things have changed and things are going to be different on this new show. She's not going to be her little sister anymore. She's going to be her equal and her partner. But really, the basis of this argument has to do with the fact that Bradley feels hurt by the fact that Alex didn't really reach out to her after she left the show. She called her, but it was a week after she told the network she wasn't coming back. And since then, she hasn't talked to her at all. Bradley screams at Alex, everybody in that room is out for themselves, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to compete with you for the best stories. And Alex yells back, do it. That's what you should do. Don't roll over. You should never roll over. That's literally the job. Just do the job. Sorry I didn't call you. We worked together for a month. We don't owe each other a thing. But then Bradley asks, what about Chip? Do you owe him anything? Because I talked to him and he said he hasn't heard from you either. And how long did you work together? 15 years? Sounds like a great thing to have a friendship with you, but congratulations on your mega deal, Alex. But a few days later, Alex realizes that Bradley is right, so she goes to pay Chip a visit. And even though Chip talked really tough on the phone saying, if I ever see her again, I'm going to have some choice words, he does it. And when Alex asks him to come back and be her producer, he says, when do I start? Life at UBA, though, starts to go back to normal. Bradley goes back to work putting on a good face with Eric. They even send Daniel to Wuhan. And then there's the matter of Hannah's settlement. Corey had told Legal, get it done, but he gets a phone call saying, we can't. They won't settle. Their number is astronomical. They're clearly trying to send a message. They want $119.2 million. And Corey knows exactly what that number is. It's the number that they paid Fred Micklin to walk away. And speaking of Fred, He's been trying to get in touch with Mitch Kessler, who is just flying under the radar living in a chateau in Italy. Mitch, though, keeps sending his calls straight to voicemail, and eventually Fred actually shows up, but Mitch slams the door in his face. And Mitch has done a pretty good job of flying under the radar, although one day, as he's just sitting in a square eating gelato, a 21st century liberal crusader, and I can say that because I'm a liberal soy boy, walks up to him and starts screaming at him in the middle of the square saying, oh, He doesn't have the right to be there. He's ruining her gelato. He's ruining her vacation. And Mitch is taking it in, but asking her to keep her voice down. Gets to the point where everyone's head is turned watching this go down. And one local walks over to her and says, you need to stop. And the crusader says, if you have any idea what this man did, and the local cuts him off and says, you mean like if I knew that this man was Mitch Kessler? He's just sitting here eating his gelato. I didn't see him come and try to grab you. Why are you kicking him when he's down? I think this is more about you. And that's when the local notices that, yeah, it is, because her best friend is filming this interaction, and she can't wait to post it to social media. The local ends up scaring the liberal crusader back to her avocado toast. And Mitch, who is mortified, ends up sneaking out, walking away, not wanting any more unwanted attention his way. But the local ends up chasing after him. She ends up introducing herself. Her name is Paula, and she's kind of in the media, but not really. But she did it to pick Mitch's brain. So he reluctantly gives her a number, and they agree to meet up later so she can do that. Corey and the creative team at UBA start working on the rollout for Alex's return. They ever go into a screening room and watch a commercial, but then the conversation goes to an interview she's doing with one of their reporters named Laura Peterson. There's currently scheduling issues. Laura wants two days. And Alex says to the group, Laura Peterson's a professional. She doesn't need two days to follow me around. But let me explain. She needs two days because she wants to chronicle Alex leaving her quiet life and heading back to the morning show. Alex seems pretty stern, though. She can get all that in one afternoon. Alex then says goodbye to the group, but right before she leaves, she remembers to tell them about Chip. And they're all a little taken aback, but Corey tells Stella, get the deal done. Now that this little bomb has been dropped, Mia walks back into the newsroom, and right before they get into the stories they're going to do that day, she lets the group know that Chip is coming back. And it's split. Some of the group is thrilled, while others, not so much. They then go along with scheduling the next day's show. And that show does include a segment with Daniel who barely got out of Wuhan. He was on the last train. He's currently quarantining in Beijing, and he drops a word that we'll all get really used to, social distancing. And Bradley and Eric kind of make fun of him for it. You can tell they're not really taking his situation all that seriously. They then, though, wrap up with Daniel because they have to make the big announcement about Alex's return. 
and it's incredibly cheesy. Corey is pumped, but, you know, Stella, no, nah, she doesn't really hide her emotions too well. She's not excited at all. Corey then goes to congratulate Bradley on just a job well done, but she tells him that she wants to moderate the debate in Vegas. He tells her, I appreciate that, but I'll defer to Stella on this one because Stella took over for Corey as the head of news. Corey took over for Fred, but Bradley can't believe that all of a sudden he's deciding to defer to Stella. She starts giving Corey a whole lot of attitude, telling Corey that he needs somebody who people know is an independent thinker. Alex Levy is always going to be thought of as the morning show, but moving forward, when people think of political coverage, she wants them to think about her. He reminds her, though, that Laura Peterson is going to interview her for Alex's return, and she's going to interview her at the Iowa caucus. So that is politics. Corey tries to switch topics, but Bradley says, I am going to moderate that debate. And he turns to her and says, Bradley, is your microphone on? And when she says no, he says, good, because I can't have you talking to me like this in a room full of my employees. Good show, though. And then he leaves. After the show that day, Bradley's going to have lunch with Alex. She feels kind of bad. They left on bad terms, and they are going to be reuniting. Alex starts telling Bradley that she's done a lot of soul searching in the last nine months, and she's changed, but Bradley doesn't really buy it. Alex, though, does apologize, and Bradley does seem to appreciate it. But the women's conversation gets interrupted when Maggie Brenner walks up. They exchange some quick pleasantries, but once Maggie leaves, Alex starts ripping her. And Bradley can't figure out why, because she thinks Maggie is just a nice person. And Alex thinks that's a pretty naive comment. Alex then asks Bradley if she talked to Maggie for her book, and Bradley says, yeah, I did, but I didn't say anything bad about you. She can tell that Alex thinks she was an idiot for talking to Maggie for her book. So she reminds Alex, I've been in this business for over 20 years. I'm not going to let some journalist wrangle me into a comment that I didn't mean to say. And Alex tells her, I understand you've been in this industry for a while, but you might not be used to the Maggie Brenners and the Laura Petersons of this world. And Bradley kind of gets upset because she feels like Alex is poisoning her brain about Laura Peterson before she even meets the woman. Alex, though, goes on to tell her that she's had a lot of run-ins with Laura. She doesn't particularly trust her. She didn't think Laura likes her. So that's why she's kind of got her back up. One of the things she wanted to accomplish here today was getting their facts straight. Bradley is pretty surprised by this, thinking that Alex sounds crazy, but Alex asks her, what are we going to say about our last day? How I was trying to get you fired, and I found out that you interviewed Mitch behind my back, and you interviewed Hannah the day she died? And do we really need people to know that I announced you as my co-anchor on a whim to get back at the network? Bradley gets Alex's point, so the two women start game planning on how to get their story straight. A couple of days later, Alex gets ready for her big interview with Laura. Alex is doing it at her apartment so she's more comfortable, and one of the many people that's going to be there is Chip. Although, Chip is a little concerned because his deal isn't done yet. Chip is really there to kind of calm Alex down for moments like when Laura doesn't show up on time. And instead of Alex being the first one, her ego trip makes Laura wait when she finally does show up. Chip decides to leave Alex alone for a bit and walks out, and that's when he sees Mia and Corey and Stella. And Mia seems happy to see Chip. Corey, however, you know, you never really can tell. He puts on the facade, but Stella does not hide her emotions. He then sees Laura walk in, so he goes to grab Alex, and while he's doing so, Corey goes and talks to Laura, asking her nicely to kind of prep Bradley a little bit when she's out in Iowa, make her realize that reporting on things like sweatshops isn't really morning show material. She doesn't say yes, but she also doesn't say no, and then she gets ready to do the interview with Alex. Everybody who doesn't need to be there is told to get out. That actually includes Corey and Stella. So they head to the elevator, and Stella can't hold it in anymore. She tells Corey, I don't think it was a good idea to bring Chip back, and I wasn't going to say anything, but we need to talk to Alex. And Corey tells her, when we're not in a tailspin, you can do your loop-de-loops, but until then, you need Alex to land as much as I do. And Stella kind of takes offense to that and tells him, it's not like I don't want to approve stuff, it's because I actually care about this stuff. I want to build things, but it's tough to do when there's no foundation. And Corey says, I hear you. But in order to make those changes, you know what you need? You need success. So we need to keep Alex happy so she is successful. As they head home, Laura starts the interview. And it starts off with UBA's issues. But then Laura asks about Hannah. And that wasn't on the table. Alex actually says she was a pretty private person and I want to respect her privacy. And Laura doesn't press it. But she does go into Maggie Brenner's book. Maggie provided Laura with an excerpt from the book detailing the toxic environment that was at UBA. And Alex is getting visibly uncomfortable, but she handles it like a pro. She does, however, get pretty upset when Laura asks her, what was the nature of your relationship between you and Mitch Kessler? Implying that the two had slept together. 
Alex kind of thinks about it, is a little taken aback, but says he was my best friend. But Mitch could be a lot of things to many people, and I cut off contact with him. When the interview wraps up and everybody leaves, Alex is pissed, and she starts taking it out on Chip. She was totally taken off guard by that question. She feels like it was more of an accusation, and she can't believe that somebody from the own network would actually ask it. And the reason she's taking it out on Chip is because he's the one who approved the questions, but he makes it clear. The question I approve is more of, how was your relationship with Mitch, not what was the nature of your relationship? Chip tries to calm her down by telling her that he doesn't think the network should use it anyway, and he thinks she's slightly overreacting to this whole situation. But now that Laura Peterson's done with Alex, she moves on to Bradley in the Iowa caucus. And right before Bradley's going to get on the plane with Laura, she gets a phone call from Alex. And Alex goes on to tell Bradley about the question that she got regarding Mitch. But she's telling her this because she was taken off guard and she just want Bradley to be taken off guard. Right before she hangs up the phone though, she does make it clear to Bradley, by the way, I did not sleep with Mitch. And then Bradley gets on the plane and meets Laura Peterson for the first time. When they get to Iowa, Bradley and Laura do the interview and Bradley shines. For Bradley, it kind of is a puff piece. But back in New York, Bradley's Iowa caucus stories are bumping Daniel and his update with the coronavirus. And after getting bumped yet again, Daniel ends up calling Mia because he's pissed. He says, you sent me across the world to the epicenter of an epidemic, and now I'm stuck in a hotel for 14 days quarantining, and now you're bumping me. Mia tries to explain, though, that they're in the middle of an impeachment, the Iowa caucus, and Kobe Bryant just died. So the stuff that he got bumped for is a pretty big deal. Daniel starts telling Mia on why an update on the coronavirus is important, and Mia starts telling him that she can hear TVs tuning out. Because at this point, and in the timeline, we're in early February, most Americans still aren't concerned with it. Now, while Mia is trying to calm down Daniel, Chip has made his return to UBA, and he finds that half the workers are thrilled and half the workers are not, and Rennett tells him that there are just some people that need some time to get over what happened. He then goes to look at the footage from the Laura Peterson interview, and he lets the editor know that he didn't approve the question, so he wants to tighten it up a little bit, because it does look pretty bad for Alex. Later that night, Bradley gives an update on the news about the Iowa caucus. They still don't have a winner. And as Alex is watching her report from home, she texts Bradley asking how it went with Laura. And Bradley doesn't get the text right away because she's just heading into her hotel room. As she's laughing with Laura about the fact that they don't have a result for the thing that they came out for, Laura lets her know that Corey wanted Laura to coach Bradley up. And the reason she's telling her this is because after seeing her in action, she doesn't feel like she needs to be coached up. And another reason she's telling her all this is because that she feels like Bradley is bigger than the morning show. She says to Bradley, the people that stay on the morning show can't really do anything else, but clearly Bradley can. Bradley is absolutely blushing. She's thrilled to get a compliment from such an accomplished woman. But Laura then asks about the relationship between her and Alex. And Bradley kind of laughs it off and doesn't answer the question. When she does end up getting back into her hotel room, she sees Alex's text message and she responds with, it went great. Alex, though, doesn't see it until the next day. When Bradley and Laura have gotten back into New York and they're driving over to the studio. And Alex responds and asks, so she didn't ask anything invasive? And of course, she did. She kind of did with the last question. But Bradley sees it and puts it to the side. And maybe one of the reasons is she's sitting right next to Laura. And she turns to Laura and says, do you think you got everything you needed for the interview? And Laura says, yeah. Honestly, I could have left yesterday, but I was having too much fun. She then gets a little bit closer to Bradley, though, and says, now that the cameras are off, now that I see how awesome you are, Do you mind if I ask you a personal follow-up question just between us? And Bradley says, yeah, of course. And Laura asks her, were you vetted for this job? And Bradley doesn't say a thing. But she leans in and starts making out with Laura. Maybe it was a deflection. Maybe it's because she was actually attracted to her. Laura is, after all, a lesbian. But it definitely is a topic changer. A couple days later, Daniel is able to leave Beijing. Eric ends up leaving the morning show. They say goodbye to him. The Laura Peterson special airs, and because of Chip's editing ability, the question doesn't look that bad. And Corey ends up getting a call from Fred, but he ignores it. Because the next day, Alex Levy and Bradley Jackson are reuniting on the morning show. But the reason that Fred called is the same reason that he went all the way to Italy to visit Mitch. He finally gets Mitch to actually walk and talk with him. And the reason he showed up is because he wants to file a class action lawsuit against UBA. While Fred feels bad about what happened with Hannah, he takes no responsibility at all. Mitch, on the other hand, does feel guilty about what happened. He feels like Fred is being completely callous, and he wants nothing to do with a class action lawsuit. Fred keeps hammering home to Mitch that at the end of the day, they bear no legal responsibility, and they should not have to pay all of this money 
because, quote, some girl couldn't handle herself. But even with Fred's plea, Mitch has no interest in a class action. That night, he ends up meeting up with Paola. But they start going through Paola's career. She's a documentarian. She's kind of looking for, like, a regular steady job. And Mitch says, well, maybe I can pass off your stuff to somebody who can help. But Mitch's phone is blowing up. He doesn't want to get it, but Paola insists. And that's when, across the world, he ends up seeing the news that Alex Levy and Bradley Jackson are back together. And the reason his phone's blowing up is because people want him to comment on it. This upsets Mitch. So he says to Paola, I'm going to go. But Paola's curious as to why and grabs his phone. And that's when she sees the news. And she can't believe he's ready to just leave because of that. She tells him that that's your past. You have a chance to move on now. And Mitch says, I have moved on, but that is still a part of my life. And her advice to him is, you're never going to outrun the sadness, so grow some balls. The two start kind of arguing about Mitch's current situation a little bit. But Paula yells at him, you can still do good in the world, you can help people. Like, I want your help. I want you to do a documentary. There was an appeals court in Italy who overturned a rape conviction because the defendant said the victim was too ugly to rape. At this time, though, if Mitch is going to do a documentary, it's definitely not going to be about sexual abuse. So he stands up, thanks her, pays the bill, and then leaves. But a few days go by, he reconsiders, and he messages Paola, if the offer still stands, I'd like to help you with that documentary. We'll start off episode four with Mitch. Mitch and Paola head to a local university so that Paola can interview a professor for that documentary she's working on. But as she heads inside, Mitch gets a phone call from his ex-wife, Paige. And that's because the editor of the New York Daily News called Paige after someone tried to plant a pretty disparaging story about Hannah. Paige figures that it might be Mitch, but Mitch denies that he had anything to do with this. So as soon as he gets off the phone with Paige, he immediately calls Corey, who's in the middle of watching some programming that might or might not make it on UBA+. He tells Corey that someone's launched a smear campaign against Hannah, and immediately Corey knows that it was Fred. Mitch tells him that even though the New York Daily News won't run it, somebody will. They start getting into it about what exactly Corey's supposed to do about this. With Corey finding it very ironic that Mitch, the whole reason why this Hannah story is coming out really, is the one who's calling him and telling him to do something about it. Mitch yells at him, you're the CEO, do what the CEO does and handle it. Handle it, handle the suit, make it all go away. After a few hours, Paola comes out, Paola and Mitch head back to Paola's place, and she starts going over the footage of the interview with the professor, which went really well. The professor clearly admitted that there is problems in the Italian judicial system, with Paola bringing up the case of Amanda Knox. Paola ended up making both of them dinner, but she's not willing to serve Mitch. And as they're kind of laughing and joking around, Paola kisses him on the cheek, but Mitch says, don't do that. He is extremely uncomfortable. The next day, Mitch wakes up to a phone call from Paola, and she lets him know that the professor had contacted her because he had just tested positive for the coronavirus. And since Paola was with him, and she was with Mitch, really doing her civic duty by letting him know that he could have been exposed to this thing. But now they have to quarantine for 14 days. But she suggests that they quarantine together, work on this documentary, use the 14 days productively. So now Mitch has that to deal with. But back in the States, Alex's big return is a hit. Alex is the number one trending topic on Twitter. People are loving the fact she's back. But Alex gets pretty uncomfortable when they start bringing up terms like feminist god and modern day hero. She clearly doesn't see herself like that at all. The segment ends and Ty, the guy who's the social media wizard for the show, walks by Yanko and lets him know that someone retweeted his Groundhog Day video, but it's not in a good way. Yanko had the audacity to say that the Groundhog was his spirit animal. And since it's 2021, or I guess in this case, it's still 2020, but still nothing's changed. People just wake up looking to be offended by something. And unfortunately for Yanko Flores, this is it. So Yanko is going to have to have a meeting later that day with Stella and Mia. Also after the show, Alex and Bradley split up. They went their separate ways. Alex feels like a million bucks. Chip brings up the debate because they have to book the travel and all that, but Alex has no interest in moderating that debate. But Chip tells her that she really should reconsider. In the other dressing room, Bradley is quickly decompressing from the show. She's still hoping for moderator, but at the moment, she says she has a, quote, meeting to get to. One that was off the books that she scheduled for herself. This isn't a normal meeting. This is one of those bedroom meetings. And that meeting is with Laura. After they have some adult fun, Bradley needs to get going. She has to meet with Corey. And Bradley tells Laura that she's planning on walking into Corey's office and demanding moderator and not leaving until she gets it. And Laura can't believe that that's how the two talk. Because she's known Corey a long time and she knows that Corey wouldn't let just anybody talk to him like that. Bradley explains that it's complicated and Laura says, well, I'm all ears. So Bradley starts explaining 
the relationship between her and Corey. About how on Alex's last show, they fired Corey, they put Fred on leave, and they suspended Bradley. Because of this, her and Corey got really close. But a couple days later, when she got her opportunity to address the board, she unloaded on them. She told him that Fred needed to be fired and Corey was the guy to replace him. A day later, he came down to her room and he said that they made him CEO. The first move that he was doing is lifting her suspension. But now, her attitude is, screw that guy. Laura then tells Bradley, you know they're talking about replacing him, right? UBA's in third, which wouldn't be a huge deal, but there's scandals surrounded by it. He's had a little bit of success for him, but people have a short memory. It comes down to money, and he's investing a lot of it in UBA+. Plus. And really, who wants another streaming service? At this point, UBA's balance sheet is a mess. So Laura suggests to Bradley that she talk to Corey, make amends with him. Even if it's just for show, at this moment, Corey is her CEO, the network is her partner. Making the network her ally and not her foe will help her career. So Bradley heads off with the idea that she'll meet with Corey at some point later that day. But back at UBA, Daniel wants to talk to Mia. Mia, though, doesn't really have a lot of time. She has to run to that meeting with Stella and Yanko. So she's not exactly all ears, but the reason that Daniel stopped her is because he wants to be the moderator. Daniel has noticed an unfavorable pattern for people of color at UBA, and he doesn't like it. He's coming to Mia because he figures that she also can commiserate with this, and with her current role, she can help. So all he's asking is that when she talks to Stella, she push for Daniel to moderate. Mia promises, yes, I will plead your case, and then she heads up to the meeting with Yanko, where they have to address the elephant in the room, I should say the spirit animal in the room. They tell Yanko that he's going to have to apologize on air because of it, and Yanko can't understand why. Honestly, he doesn't think he did anything wrong, but Stella and Mia have to make him understand that he's going to have to save face. Yanko knows he's going to have to do it, he just feels like he's completely misunderstood. Now with just Mia and Stella alone in the office, Mia starts pleading her case to Stella for Daniel to moderate. Stella tells Mia that Corey's made it clear he wants Alex to moderate. Stella wants someone named Noreen, but the fact is Daniel is on a long list of people that have thrown their hat in the ring. Mia continues to plead Daniel's case, but Stella tells Mia that she just doesn't feel like Daniel has the it factor. She feels like Daniel's more of a Ringo, not necessarily a Paul or John. Mia absolutely disagrees with this, but Stella's just not blown away from what she's seen from Daniel. Mia ends up heading out of the office, and Stella heads down to meet with Alex and Chip to try to get Alex to agree to do the debate. Stella puts on her fake face, acting the whole time that she really wants Alex to do this when really she's just doing Corey's bidding for her. But she gives Corey spiel, saying that it's not about viewers. Everyone's going to be watching the debate anyway. It's about the recent negative backlash in the press. They need to prove to the public that they can still provide quality content. And nothing's more quality than Alex Levy. Stella says, you're going to kill it, and you'll get a ton of buzz from it. But Alex takes that offensively. She doesn't feel like she needs buzz. And she tells Stella, I think there's some people here that have a lot more to prove. So, no. Stella says, okay, I hear you, but please reconsider, think about it, that's all I ask. And once she leaves the room, Alex starts ripping Stella to Chip. And Chip starts informing Alex on where Stella came from. She used to run a data media company and Corey paid a lot of money to absorb it and then thus making Stella the head of news. But Alex just thinks that she's way too young and hasn't dealt with enough crap to be bossing people around. Down in the newsroom, Daniel had sought out Mia to see how the conversation went. And Mia tells him that it probably won't be him. And Daniel thinks that it might be a race thing or a sexual orientation thing. But Mia's honest with him and says, no, it's because Stella doesn't think you have the it factor. And that almost pisses off Daniel even more. Everybody then goes home. Corey is sitting in his room. He's really taking what Mitch said to heart. He's hired a private investigator to find out what stories Fred is planting and where he's planting them. And then gets a knock at the door and it's Bradley. When he opens the door, he sees her and says, I don't know who's moderating. And honestly, it's kind of beneath my position. She tells him, it's not about that. She walks inside and starts telling him that she doesn't like how their friendship has suffered. She's not okay with it. She wants to make amends. They have it out right then and there in Corey's room, but at the end of it, they do end up making amends. They hug it out, but at the end, he does let her know that Alex will probably be moderating the debate. He just doesn't see them using two straight white women to moderate the debate. Bradley thanks him for the honesty, and then she heads out, and she heads straight to Laura's place. She tells Laura that she took her advice, making amends with Corey. Asked about the debate, and Bradley tells her that she's not going to be doing it, and she gets it. The optics of it, having two white, straight women moderate a debate. And Laura says, wait, you just called yourself straight. Bradley says, yeah, because to most of the world, I am. But Laura questions as to why that is. 
And Bradley starts kind of explaining that most of the time she is straight, but she doesn't like putting a label on her sexuality. And the reason that Laura is getting so upset is because it is well known that she is a lesbian. And it's been known for a long, long time. And yet, yeah, now it's accepted. But 20 years ago, it wasn't. 20 years ago, she lost her job because of it. It wasn't like she wanted this information out there, but people talk and it got out there. And because of everything that she went to, there's something inside of her that wants to be resentful because Bradley isn't grateful for the gift that she's been given. Because Laura Peterson walked so that people like Bradley could run. She's basically telling Bradley, use the fact that you hook up with women as your advantage. But Bradley doesn't want to use her identity like that. Laura, however, questions that, thinking that it has more to do with the fact that Bradley is from a West Virginia small town that might not be accepting of people like her. Bradley gets up and says, you know what, this was a mistake. And Laura says, that's it, get out of here. Go live in your delusional world. And Bradley starts yelling at her how she's not delusional. She's not a country bumpkin. And then she smashes a pretty expensive vase. She then gets kicked out and has to just walk home with her thoughts. Everybody reconvenes back at the studio for the next day's airing. Yanko and Daniel start commiserating about the fact that Daniel doesn't like being labeled. Yanko doesn't like being misunderstood. But they're both going to have to eat shit. As they're setting up their segments during a commercial break, one of the production assistants runs in and tells Mia that the guest that they had booked is not going to make it. So Mia has to think on the fly. She tells the production assistant, just walk around, find somebody. Somebody's got to be in this building. And Chip, who overhears this, pulls the production assistant aside and says that there's somebody with Howard Stern's show. Grab that person and bring them down. But Mia walks over to Chip and says, what are you doing? Chip explains that he overheard that Howard Stern was having this guest. And Mia just says, don't undermine my authority. Even though Chip was trying to help, Mia once again says, don't undermine my authority. And it has Chip questioning if Mia even wants him there. Because earlier, Alex let it spill that Stella didn't want Chip there. And after the reaction he got when he came back from some of the producers... It's got Chip questioning if UBA is really the right choice for him. The show gets back on air, though. Yanko apologizes. He doesn't do a great job, though, I'll tell you that. He doesn't really use the right terminology, saying things like, I'm sorry if anybody was offended. But as Yanko is butchering this, Stella gets a phone call from Corey. He wants to know where they stand on the moderators because he wants to wrap this thing up that day. She gives him the update that Alex isn't going to do it. She keeps pushing for her person, Noreen. And Corey starts laughing. He's obviously stressed out, but he says, I'm just trying to get us to mid-March so we can launch this streaming service, which no one really wants, as if we're going to force feed them content. And I can't even trust you to do this thing. I mean, why did I give you the job? You didn't have to sell us your company. You chose to sell us your company. Things like this, this is the job. And Stella says, you know, I've been wondering why you brought me on. I mean, what's the point if you're not going to listen to anything I have to say? Is it just so you can parade an Asian woman around, making it look like you listen and you're woke? Don't just give me lip service about empowering me. Either let me do it or let me walk. Alex was never my choice for anything, and if that's what you want, do it yourself. Corey says, you're underestimating me, but you're also underestimating Alex. Talent is talent, and recognizing talent is an executive's only real job. So make this work now or don't. Stella says, I got it. Everything done the same by a young Asian woman is looked at as different. She hangs up the phone, but then Corey's phone immediately rings because it's the private investigator. Earl lets him know that the genie's not going back in the bottle. There's too many blogs, too many newspapers, too many everything. Someone is going to end up running it. The only real way to kill the story is by going directly to Fred, which Corey doesn't want to do. So on top of everything Corey has to deal with, he also has this issue. After Stella hung up the phone, she started walking back to the production room when she passes by Daniel. And she has no idea that Daniel knows that she doesn't think he has the it factor. And she puts on her fake voice and says, I'm really looking forward to your segment. But at that moment, Daniel has decided to make a change. If she doesn't think he has the it factor, he's going to show her the it factor. And he does that by serenading Alex on the morning show. And none of this was planned. Everybody in the production room is very confused, but they have to let it go. They can't cut out of it. But as Daniel is poorly serenading Alex, Bradley, who just found out that Alex said no to the debate, goes to track down Stella and plead her case. She starts to tell Stella that there's something that Stella doesn't know about her. And you think maybe she's going to divulge that she is a lesbian, or at the very least bisexual, but she doesn't. She can't get it out. She just says that she comes from a conservative family. It's not exactly the diversity that anyone's really looking for. When Stella walks out of this impromptu meeting and starts walking back to the production room, A woman walks up to her and gives her the overnight numbers from Alex's return, Alex's interview, and it was huge. Not only that, but sponsors are coming back. Looks like Corey's move paid off and maybe Stella was wrong. 
Stella walks back in the production room at the very end of Daniel's serenading of Alex. But when the show ends, everyone's telling Daniel what a great job he did, how awesome it was. But there's one person who is clearly not amused, and that is Mia. He also gets news from Stella that he won't be doing it. Stella, though, has to go get Alex to do this debate. She walks into her dressing room, and right off the bat, the conversation is pretty combative. Stella knows that Alex doesn't really like her, or respect her for that matter. But the conversation flips from combative to a genuine appeal. Stella tells Alex that when she did what she did, she made a connection with the women of this country. Even though Alex doesn't think that's true, it is. Stella tells her, you mean something to these women. As a leader, as a feminist, I want you to be these things. So if you're looking for a brand, there it is. And honestly, I don't know why you don't want to take that mantle. Nine months ago, you opened a door. Walk through it. She wraps up by telling Alex, by the way, it was a great show today. And then she walks out. And that night, Alex heads home and starts looking up topics for the debate. That same night, Bradley does not head home. She heads to Laura's place. She buys her a $300 gift card to buy a new vase. And she heads to her place and starts apologizing because she just doesn't really know who she is. Laura, though, doesn't really seem receptive to the apology. She starts walking back in her apartment, but that's when Bradley just grabs her and hugs her. Laura's kind of surprised by this, but she does hug her back. And it seems like the two women are on their way to making amends, much like Bradley and Corey. And speaking of Corey, he had a meeting with Sybil. He explains to Sybil exactly what's going on with the Hannah stories, but he needs her help in killing it. He says to her, you're friends with Fred, and I need you to talk to him and have him stop. And while Sybil feels terrible for Hannah's family, she's not friends with Fred. In fact, she tells Corey, the last time I spoke to Fred, he told me that you were the best business decision. And if I'm being honest, I don't think that that's true at all. You let the talent walk all over you if you call Bradley Jackson talent, and you push us hard to buy out Fred rather than have a true independent investigation. That right there brings up all sorts of questions, questions that honestly I don't need answered. This is a business, not a morality play. If the stories he's planting aren't true, then the girl's family is going to have a hell of a liable lawsuit. The fact that you showed up here instead of calling Fred directly proves to me why Fred pushed so hard to get you here, when he clearly hated you with a passion. Actions have consequences, so whatever those consequences are, it's really none of my business. In episode 5 on the heels of that conversation with Sybil, Corey calls up Fred, wakes him up at about 3 a.m. Italian time, and he tells him, you gotta kill these stories. I know what you're doing. Stop it. Fred says, Corey, I tried to contact you to get the case dismissed, and you never called me back, so I took matters in my own hands. And by the way, from what I understand, they're not nasty. They're true. Fred then actually kind of blackmails Corey because it was Corey's idea to pay off Fred. Fred sort of talked him into it at the time because Fred knew that the end was near. So he convinced him that he would be his Nixon, Corey would be Gerald Ford. He would take it over, but he would also pardon him. And by pardon, I mean give him a fat settlement. And that's exactly what Corey did. So Fred tells him, the woke mob is not going to enjoy hearing that you paid me off. So if that deal goes away, there's no reason for me to spare you. The next day, TMS goes off without a hitch. They plug the fact that they'll be doing the Democratic presidential debates. They explain the roles of both Alex and Bradley. And then they start going into post-show. For Alex, that means sitting in a room with a bunch of production assistants going over possible questions for the candidates. But she is extremely stressed out. Alex, though, has to cut this practice short because she gets a note saying Audra is in her office, and that's a surprise. When Alex asks her what she's doing, Audra says, oh, you know, I was having lunch with Daniel and decided to just kind of pop by, even though the two don't really have that kind of relationship. But the real reason Audra showed up was because Maggie Brenner's book comes out in a month, and her first stop at the book tour is going to be at YDA. Audra plays this off like, Alex, if you don't want me to do it, I won't. But in reality, it's kind of bragging about the fact that not only is she going to get this interview with Maggie Brenner first, she's also going to get a copy of the book early. She's going to know exactly what's inside of it, and that eats Alex up. The fact that she doesn't know what's being written about her kills her. As Audra heads out, Alex says, whoa, 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 let's cut the bullshit. I've always been gracious to you, have I not? And Audra kind of chuckles and says, oh my god, you actually believe that. But hey, passes in the past, and we'll let water be under that bridge. And then Audra walks out, and Alex is pretty surprised about that. Alex then returns to the meeting room to find an empty meeting room. Chip dismissed everybody because Alex was gone for so long, and that's when Alex fills Chip in on the YDA Maggie Brenner situation. She tells Chip, you gotta get me that book, but Chip says, I, I can't. They're certainly not gonna give it to me. 
And Alex starts screaming at him about the fact that he's not even back more than a few months before he starts saying what he can't do. Chip, however, tries to get the conversation back on track, saying, you know what, we have a lot of work to do. Let's just focus on the debate. But Alex injured her back, and it's flaring up. That also might be one of the reasons why she's kind of being a bitch. So she leaves early. Later that day, Chip's fiance Madeline, stops by, and one of the reasons why she stopped by was to actually meet Alex. But she's surprised to find out that Alex left early with that back issue. And Chip tells Madeline, yeah, it got real today. I can't believe she actually convinced me to come back. Madeline tells him, hey, whatever happens, we'll figure it out. And the two head home. The next day, Corey is planning on going to Green Bay. Kyle stops by to give him everything he'll need, including his itinerary. And as he's leaving, Kyle says, by the way, you know who's dating? Laura Peterson and Bradley Jackson. Corey chuckles it and says, no, they're not. But Kyle starts saying how he can't confirm it, but his friends saw the two walking down the street. And Corey cuts him off and says, nobody likes a gossip, Kyle. Although Corey realizes how that sounds, so he clarifies it by saying, well, one, it's not true. But two, nobody likes gossip, so don't do it. And it seems like the reason why Corey is so adamant it's not true is because he might have firsthand experience that Bradley isn't a lesbian. There might have been something that happened the night before Bradley barged into the UBA offices demanding that Corey come back. Might have been a drunken fling, although we don't know for sure. Either way, the next day, all the talent at UBA, i.e. Alex, Laura Peterson, and Bradley fly out to Vegas for the Democratic presidential debates. And Alex's mood has not changed at all. The group touches down in Vegas a few hours later, and as Alex and Chip are walking to the hotel, they see from afar Maggie Brenner. And Alex does a very awkward pretending not to see Maggie so she doesn't come up and talk to her. Maggie, however, notices it but doesn't say anything, just getting in a cab. But it's become obvious the real reason for all of Alex's stress has suddenly arrived in Las Vegas. While that group was going to Vegas, Corey was going to Green Bay in a secret meeting that nobody other than Eric knew about, and that was because he wanted to meet with Hannah's father. As soon as he walks into Hannah's father's bar, Hannah's father knows who he is. And as you can imagine, he tells him, you need to leave, but Corey has come trying to convince Hannah's father to take the money. And Hannah's father says that the reason why he wants as much money as he asked for is because that's what they gave that scumbag Fred Micklin. It becomes clear to Corey that he has to take the kid gloves off. So he tells Hannah's father, your daughter is about to be smeared in the papers. They're going to say horrible things like she slept to get information. She was a drug addict. So I'm begging you, take the money because they want to make this as muddy as possible. So you're in a situation where you just give up and you get nothing. I want to do right by your daughter. UBA should pay for this, but take what they're offering you. And to Corey's surprise, Hannah's father asks if the allegations are true. Corey has to let him know that, to his knowledge, yeah, some of them actually are. He was only in Wisconsin for that meeting, and when he touches down back in New York, he gets a phone call from their fixer, who lets him know that the stories about Hannah have been killed everywhere except one publication. And the only way that this publication will kill the story about Hannah is if they have something more salacious. So Corey is fighting an uphill battle to get the whole thing scrubbed. The next day, out in Vegas, Alex goes to rehearsal for the presidential debate, and then afterwards, she goes and hangs out with Chip, but her back is still acting up. As they're walking back to their rooms, they start talking about the Maggie Brenner book and what could possibly be in it, and Chip throws a possibility out there of something that Alex said, but she stops him and says, oh, I didn't say that, and Chip tries to tell her, yeah, you did, but Alex is adamant that she did not say it. Of course, Chip knows that she did. So Chip has to tell her, sometimes you have a selective memory. You forget how things actually played out. And that's when it dawns on Alex that Chip never forgets anything. So she asks him, oh my god, did you did you talk to Maggie Brenner? And Chip admits, yeah, I'm off the record, I did. They both start screaming at each other, Chip reminding her that he had just gotten fired. Alex yelling at him for not disclosing this information when he took the job. And when cooler heads prevailed, Chip tells her, I just needed people to know that I'm not this horrible person. And Alex says, okay, you want to look like a hero, but what does that mean for me? And Chip says, you look like you. But after the conversation she had with Audra, and now hearing Chip tell her she has selective memory over a comment that she thinks was pretty heinous, she's wondering, what does that even mean? I'm going to look like me. And later that night, she can't sleep. So she ends up hobbling down the hall and knocking on Maggie Brenner's door and demanding a copy of the book. Maggie, however, tells her that she doesn't have a copy, but Alex starts rummaging around her hotel room for it. And while she doesn't find a copy, she does find the title, The Wrong Side of the Bed. It's got Alex and Mitch on the cover. Maggie asks her, is there something specific you want to know? And Alex tells her that Laura Peterson insinuated that her and Mitch had slept together. And Maggie says, yeah, 
That's in the book. And Alex starts crying, saying that it's not true, but in a way that makes you think it is true. And telling Maggie she doesn't want to be associated with Mitch at all. Especially not in that way. But it's too late. Maggie had offered Alex the opportunity to comment on the book, but Alex never responded. Even after Alex says that she'll sue Maggie for defamation and libel, Maggie simply says, well, if it's not true, then sue. Maggie tells her, the book is done, and I'm not changing that. And I'm not going to include this little epilogue, so don't think I don't care. Alex starts crying, begging Maggie not to do this, but then she asks exactly who told her that the two had sex, asking if it was Mitch. And Maggie says, I did speak to him briefly. I can quote him for you. He said, fuck off. So if it wasn't Mitch, then who was it? Alex is left to just go back to her room, but one person it possibly could have been is Laura Peterson, who is in another hotel room hanging out with Bradley, and Bradley inquires as to the bad blood between Laura and Alex, because while Bradley doesn't like Alex particularly, she doesn't have the disdain for her that Laura does. So Laura tells her that when Alex first showed up in New York, Laura was at YDA, and she was doing really well for herself, and there was a certain amount of people in their inner circle that knew she was a lesbian. Alex started hanging out with those people, and she seemed fine with it. But shortly after Alex found out the truth, that's when YDA found out. Laura ended up losing her job. Now, Laura can't prove that it was Alex, but one thing she does know is that Alex never came to her defense, going so far as to, a few years later, seeing Laura on the street and acting like she didn't know who she was, completely ignoring her. That's something that Laura Peterson will never forget. She's never brought this up to Alex, but she just doesn't want to waste her time with her. Bradley then gets a text message from Corey asking if she's up, and Bradley lies to her saying, actually, yeah, your text message just woke me up. But she gets caught in her lie because Corey had called her room to no answer. So Bradley ends up calling him up to see what's going on, digging down deeper into that lie, trying to hide where she really is, which is in Laura's room. And as she's talking, Corey can hear in the background Laura talk to Bradley. Bradley, however, tells Laura, it's Corey on the line. You gotta shut up. But now Corey is thinking that the gossip that Kyle was talking about might actually be true. Corey called, though, not to find out if Bradley was a lesbian, but for some advice. He tells Bradley about the situation, about how this one publication won't back down. And Bradley reminds him this was the one thing Hannah did not want, her name just dragged through the mud. Corey asks her, if I can find another story and to keep Hannah's name out of the public eye, do I do it? And Bradley emphatically says, yes. The two hang up, and Bradley has to get ready for the debates the next day. But while Alex was supposed to host them, She doesn't. She actually flies home on a private jet, and Eric, Bradley, and their chief political reporter at UBA end up having to manage the debate. Now, one person I haven't mentioned at UBA this episode is Yanko Flores. He's noticed that he was taken off assignment from being outside, so he goes to Mia and asks what's up, and Mia says that the apology that he gave didn't go over well. So their plan is to take him down, talk to some Native American tribes, find out their culture, film the whole thing, and hopefully that'll squash this whole ordeal. But Yanko hates the fact that it has to be filmed. He thinks it'd be way more sincere if it's not on camera. But Mia reminds him if it's not on camera, our listeners don't know about it. This sends Yanko off. He stands up for himself and says, I'm not doing it. This is ridiculous. I already apologized. I'm sorry, but no. I'm not going to genuflect at the altar of Stella's progressive bullshit. Stella's full of shit. So I'm sorry, Mia, but I'm not doing this. Yanko storms off set, goes to his dressing room, cleans up, and goes to get lunch. But as he's coming back to the UBA office, Stella's walking out. And right before she gets in her car, some douchebag yells, Hey, don't give me the China flu. And of course, Stella takes exception to it, calling him ignorant. But she hops in the car and gets out of there. She clearly is shook by this, though. And unbeknownst to her, Yanko comes to her defense. He walks up to the guy and says, Dude, what's your problem? First of all, she's Korean, idiot. And that's when the guy goes in on Yanko because he's Latin American. I mean, the guy is just a complete piece of shit racist. When the guy puts his hands on Yanko, Yanko beats the crap out of him. Problem for Yanko is it's caught on camera phone and he knows he has an issue. While Yanko tried to do the right thing, he knows this is going to come back to bite him. And finally, let's head over to Italy with Mitch. He's sequestered with Paolo, going through quarantine, but also finishing up the documentary. And they do that. Pella ends up asking him, why did you decide to quarantine with me? And Mitch says, I like you. I like your company. But just to be clear, I'm not going to have sex with you. He realizes how arrogant that sounds, so he immediately starts walking it back, but he just tells Pella, it's not that you're not attractive. I'm just broken. And Pella is completely understanding, because she knows. Later that night, Pella asks him, let me interview you. And Mitch is completely against it. She lets him know it's just for me, just for practice, nothing else. So he agrees. They set up the camera, and Mitch shows real contrition. He says he never wanted to be this guy. 
and it was his hubris that got in the way. He really thought this is what Hannah wanted. But his biggest regret wasn't sleeping with Hannah. It was the fact that when he was trying to claw his way back, he actually had the audacity to ask her for help. Even after she told him how she felt in that situation, he deflected and still wanted her help. He admits the old Mitch Kessler is a monster, but he's changed. But even nine, ten months later, the whole situation with Hannah and how it played out still eats at Mitch. In episode six, Corey, along with UBA's fixer, goes back to that publication and says, hey, we have a juicier story. We've got two female anchors in a gay relationship. At first, the publication's like, ah, it's not that juicy, kind of old hat, this isn't 1999 anymore. But in order to kill the Hannah story, Corey goes so far as to tell the publication where they're going to be so that they can snap photos and get, quote, proof of it. Bradley, however, is still in Las Vegas, reporting on the DNC. She's doing a great job, by the way, but back at UBA, Daniel continues to make some waves. He does an interview with a guy named Peter Bullard, who's doing a new show for UBA+. Plus. It's going to be an interview show. But instead of interviewing him, Daniel turns the interview awkward and combative, because I guess this Peter Bullard guy had said some not nice things about Daniel before, and Daniel decided to stick up for himself. It's completely off script, though. And it's one that Bullard ends up taking exception to, calling not only Stella, but Corey to complain about it. The next day, everybody from Vegas returns. Mia gives Bradley a nice ovation and lets her know that she's going to be heading to Phoenix and doing her own debate. Not filling in this time, but actually doing her own debate since she killed it out there. The one issue they have is nobody has an update on where exactly Alex is. And that includes Chip, who's supposed to be her producer. Chip is making excuse after excuse, really hiding behind the fact that her back was acting up. In reality, he doesn't have any idea where she is. And the network is getting antsy. They paid for her to come back, and she was back for all of, I don't know, seven days? And now she's disappeared once again. So Stella and Mia have to meet with Chip to try to get an answer on when he thinks she might be back. But Chip's timetable is pretty vague. Corey then walks into the meeting to talk about the whole Peter Bullard situation, because Bullard is really mad. And Mia takes Daniel's side of things, saying he thought he was sparring. But that's not the way Peter Bullard saw it, which means it's not the way Corey sees it. Corey then tries to get an update on what's going on with Alex, but Chip tells him the same thing he told both me and Stella. Really isn't one. They're just kind of in wait-and-see mode. And that means they need to find a replacement for Alex in the meantime. They start throwing out some ideas, and that's when Chip throws out, well, what about Laura Peterson? And Corey loves the idea. Not only is she a big name, but she's going to drive Alex nuts. It might actually drive Alex so nuts that she returns. Corey then calls Laura Peterson, and he's unaware that Bradley's over at her house, and Corey throws the idea out there, and Bradley begs her to take it, which she ultimately does. After Laura gets off the phone, Bradley suggests that maybe she just stay there. I mean, they have to head to the same place anyway, and they have to get up really early. And Laura takes it one step further by saying, you know, you can bring some stuff over. It's fine. So Bradley heads back to her hotel room to grab some things, but she has an unwelcome visitor. It's her brother who showed up out of the blue. Puts a whole wrench in her quasi moving into Laura's place. Bradley has to text Laura back saying, I'm not going to be able to make it. My brother showed up. She's also pretty suspicious. Her brother's had substance abuse issues in the past, and he just shows up out of the blue. It begs the question, why is he there? But his answer is he misses Bradley, and Bradley isn't their mother. So Bradley has to scrap the plans that she had and entertain her bro. The next day, Bradley and Laura head into TMS separately. And as Laura is walking in, she notices Chip in his office sitting there in the dark. She walks in and starts kind of poking fun at him, but starts asking about how Alex is doing. Chip gives her the spiel that she's fine, her back is acting up, she should be okay, should be back soon. And Laura tells him, I just wanted to make sure she was okay. I mean, Maggie was concerned. She said Alex was in quite a state when she came to her hotel room. And this is the first that Chip is hearing about any of this. He plays it off like he was aware, but he definitely wasn't. And he chalks it up to her being, quote, not her best that night, saying that she had mixed prescription pills and she was feeling funny. He tries to find out from Laura exactly what Alex might have said, but Laura says, Maggie didn't tell me what she said, she just was concerned. Once Laura leaves, Chip ends up calling Alex's place and asks her just to pick up the phone, but she doesn't because she's not in her place. Once Laura left Corey's office, though, she doesn't feel all that comfortable returning to morning television. She's a pro, though. She gets ready to go on television. Stella and Corey come down to see how everything goes. And while Bradley and Laura are playful, they don't give off any vibes that they're actually together. Shortly after the broadcast starts, though, Stella ends up leaving the control room because she has to meet with Yanko over the fight. She saw the video. She knows that Yanko stuck up for her, but she still has to address the situation. 
As she heads to her office, she gets stopped by Sybil. And Sybil wants to make sure that because of the fact that Yanko was sticking up for her, her judgment won't be clouded on the situation. Stella says, with all due respect, Sybil, decisions can be made without you standing behind me. And Sybil says, well, with all due respect, I'm giving you all the respect you deserve. You and Corey were brought here to clean things up, and it seems like you've done the exact opposite. The talent is running roughshod all over you guys. These are people. You can control them. And if you can't, you find people that you can. I made it clear to Corey that it was the board's decision to fire Bradley Jackson for her, quote, mystery illness. But you two decide to put her on air the next morning. And Stella lets her know that is complete news to me. Sybil, though, doesn't believe that at all. She reminds Stella that Corey is going to bat for her a lot. So, quote, don't act like you two aren't two peas in a pod. Stella then goes in her office and waits for Yanko to show up. And when he does, he's got a little bit of a black eye. Right off the bat, she thanks him for sticking up for her. The two seem to bond over the fact that she was the weird Korean kid and he was the weird Cuban kid. Yanko thinks, though, that that's it. That's the whole meeting, her thanking him. He gets up to leave and Stella says, wait, where are you going? I still have to suspend you. And Yanko can't believe that she's about to suspend him for sticking up for her. He tells Stella, I'm a racist when I say spirit animal, but then I beat up a racist and I get suspended? I mean, what am I supposed to do? And Stella says, you're supposed to do the weather. And Yanko just walks out. And ironically, he walks out as they're doing the weather on the morning show. And his villain is terrible. It gives Bradley and Laura a little bit of a break. Bradley takes the opportunity to check in on her brother. She had a little bit of an awkward morning running into him. She was checking him for drugs, and he woke up. She notices that he's called a few times, so she reminds him, I can't answer, I'm on TV. And that's when he sends her an article saying that Bradley and Laura are in a relationship. Bradley gets extremely uncomfortable with this, and Laura tries to calm her down by saying, it's going to be okay. She also has to pull herself together because she goes back on the air in 10 seconds. And as she's sitting there talking about Groucho Marx on the air, the control room is seeing exactly what has her so frazzled. Most of the talent actually starts talking about whether they believe it's true or not. Daniel says aloud that he hopes the story isn't true, and Yanko's replacement says why, because being gay is your thing? And Daniel says no, because I think it's horrible and painful to be publicly outed. It's nobody's business. This causes the weatherman to apologize and just walk away. As soon as the segment is over, Bradley runs to her dressing room to just try and get her thoughts together. And that's when Laura walks in. At first, Bradley says, you shouldn't be here. I mean, what happens if people see us both leaving this room? And Laura says, well, if it were true, we'd have to make sure that we weren't seen together. But this was just bullshit gossip, so we're in here discussing how we're going to handle it. Bradley, though, isn't quite catching up on the fact that Laura is insinuating it didn't happen. It's all lies. She's still extremely uncomfortable and... Laura says, why are you so upset? And Bradley says, it's because I don't want my private life public. Laura asks, well, can you talk to your brother about the situation? But Bradley says, no, I don't want anybody knowing my business, especially my family. Laura eventually convinces Bradley that this will all be okay, even though it's completely messed up. And Bradley comes back and closes out the show. As Mia is leaving the control room after the show, she overhears Chip talking to Raina about the fact that he doesn't know exactly where Alex is. He hasn't even talked to her. If it wasn't for the fact that Alex was talking to a production assistant named Isabella, he'd be legitimately concerned. And when Mia overhears this, she flips out. Unbeknownst to both Chip and Raina, Mia is on edge because of the fact that Vanity Fair is posting an excerpt from Maggie Brenner's book. And the headline says that Mitch Kessler targeted black women. And it makes Mia completely uncomfortable. She has a little bit of PTSD. So when she catches Chip and Raina talking, it sets her off. Chip apologizes to Mia because he can see that something's going on with her and tells her, I just want to help. And Mia says, well, if you want to help, then get my lead anchor back. And that forces Chip over to Alex's apartment. He enters very tentatively saying, hey, Alex, I'm here. Don't be scared. But he doesn't find Alex. That's when Chip discovers that Alex isn't there at all. There is someone there, however. It's Isabella. And they both are pretty surprised to see each other. And that's when Chip starts putting two and two together, that Isabella is basically house-sitting for Alex, which means that Isabella probably knows where Alex is. Chip says, I need you to tell me where she is, but Isabella says, I can't. She told me not to tell anybody. And when Chip says, well, I'm not anybody, Isabella lets him know that Alex made it specifically known she was not to tell Chip where Alex was. The conversation, though, turns pretty hostile. Isabella finds some cause to get mad at Chip. I think she picked sexism, but it might have went white knight. I don't know. It was weird. 
it culminates in Isabella just screaming at Chip and Chip just kind of throwing his hands up in the air and saying, uh, okay, and leaving, knowing that he's not getting any answers from Isabella at all. That same night, Bradley has yet to go home. She's hiding in her dressing room, and Laura calls her to see how her conversation with her brother went, only to find out that she's scared to actually confront him. After a little bit of back and forth, Laura convinces Bradley that she needs to go home. She needs to actually see her brother and talk to him about the situation. So Bradley reluctantly does. And as soon as Bradley enters the room, it's obvious on why she wanted to avoid her brother because the fighting starts right away. Her brother lets her know that their mother is completely embarrassed by this. They come from a very small town. Everybody's talking about it. And the two end up getting in a fight about why Bradley hasn't revealed this information before. They start fighting about their mother. And Bradley yells at him, I thought you came here to get away from her. And Hal says, no, I came here because I'm on drugs. I'm using Hal goes on to tell Bradley that their mother has gotten insufferable. Even with Bradley's help, she's actually gotten worse. He knows that if he's around Bradley, he won't use, but his mom kind of drives him to use. The fighting, however, gets interrupted when Corey knocks on the door, and Corey can hear the fighting inside. Bradley is trying to get her brother to calm down. She ends up leaving Hal behind to go talk to Corey, and he's shown up there to tell her that as far as the network is concerned, she doesn't have to address the situation at all. He also lets her know that if she wants to sue, the network will back her. But Bradley doesn't know if she wants to sue. She's just kind of confused and taking the whole situation in. She asks Corey, why was today so hard? I mean, why do I care what those horrible people think of me? And Corey asks, you mean the public? And Bradley says, no, I mean my family. I mean, when I'm with Laura, I see who I aspire to be. And then when I'm with my brother, I see what I really am. Corey tries to make her feel better by telling her, hey, you're your own thing. And it's working out pretty great for you. Bradley then starts to say, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this will force me to say that I actually care about somebody. And I've never really done that before, but I realize I I do want Laura. She then thanks Corey for the mini therapy session and walks back in the room and tells Hal, you gotta go. In episode 7, we head back over to Italy. The coronavirus continues to rage war all over the country. And Mitch is two days away from being over with quarantine. So he tells Paula, I think I need to go home. But before I do, I need to tell you something. And she gets really excited. But the thing he has to tell her is, I need you to delete that interview. It's not that I don't trust you. It's just I need that thing gone. And she kind of gets upset because it sounds like he doesn't trust her. But he explains, I don't trust what could happen if that thing got out. I don't trust the world. She's pretty upset, but she agrees that she will delete the interview. He then gets an alert on his phone that somebody's at the front gate, so he heads out, and boy is he surprised to find Alex Levy. He explains that he's in quarantine, but she doesn't care. She's traveled all the way across the world to see him, so he lets her in, but she didn't come to visit him out of concern. The first thing she does is yell at him for telling Maggie Brenner to fuck off. You would think that would be a good thing, but what she was actually looking for was for him to tell Maggie Brenner that nothing ever happened. She explains this book coming out could be really bad for her. Mitch says no. He's not going to make a statement. And that's when Alex really goes in on him. She tells him how she walked out of the debate, and she kind of blames that on him. She tells him how she walked out of work a week and a half in, and she kind of blames that on him. She tells him, I need you to release a statement that me and you never happen. But he tells her, no, Alex, I'm done lying. And she can't believe that he's deciding now, of all times, that he's going to stop lying. He asks her, why do I have to lie? And she explains, it's because I lied. Laura Peterson asked me on national television if me and you ever had sex, and I said no. And he asked her, you really think that's going to mess up your life, just being associated with me? And she explains, yeah, I'm worried about being canceled because you got canceled. No one will respect me if I slept with you. Mitch thinks about it for a little bit and says, all right, I'll do it. But here I thought you were doing this because you wanted to protect your children. Or maybe your husband. But no, it's the mere fact that having consensual sex with me was so vile that it'll end your career. Paolo comes in and breaks up the awkward conversation. Both women kind of give Mitch the what is she doing here look, and Paolo apologizes and leaves the room. And once she does, Alex starts ripping into Mitch about how he has another woman here. Mitch explains that he hasn't had sex with her. He doesn't want to violate her like that, ruin her, and maybe a book comes out, kind of like somebody else he knows. But Alex just finds it ironic. Mitch tries to explain that Paolo's a documentarian and a really good one, but Alex really isn't buying it, and she doesn't really care. She tells Mitch, I need you to call your publicist and release a statement. Although Mitch doesn't have a publicist, he was dropped, so he's going to have to do it on his own. That, however, is not good enough for Alex. She wants it right then and there. Even though Mitch wants to actually, like, type something up, just to get her out of the house, he writes, I did not fuck Alex Levy. Best regards, Mitch. 
Alex yells at him for just wasting her time, and what she's worried about is Mitch not doing it. So Mitch gives her his new number and sends her on her way. But when Alex leaves, Paolo comes in and says, you can't leave this like that. So she kind of urges Mitch to go outside and sort of make amends with Alex. Luckily for Mitch, Alex is trapped on the property. She can't get out because of the gate. Alex is still pretty pissed off about just everything in general, but Mitch tells her that his relationship with her is probably the second most important relationship he has on the world. So he just wants her to leave there with an understanding of sorts. He doesn't want to spend the rest of his life hating Alex, and he doesn't want her to spend the rest of her life hating him. So he talks, she listens, kind of. She gets tired of it pretty quickly and says, all right, I gotta go, I gotta catch a flight. The two, however, don't end on good terms. They get into a bit of a fight because Alex has no response for anything Mitch said. And Mitch asks her, were you really going to say that I raped you? And Alex doesn't even have a response for that. Just telling him, I need you to release a statement. Mitch yells, yeah, I'll release the goddamn statement. But just so you know, I don't think what you did with me really qualifies as sex. Alex then leaves and figures out pretty quickly that getting a plane back to the U.S. is going to be a pain. The whole country is in lockdown. She's having big issues, even though she's offering a lot of money. So when she leaves Mitch's house, she heads straight for the airport, although it's quite a drive. Mitch, however, walks back into his house, where Paula walks up with her computer, and wants to show him in person that she's going to delete the interview. Even though Mitch says it's not necessary to show him, he trusts her, Paula does it anyway. Paula then tells Mitch, it's time for me to go. This kind of takes Mitch off guard because he knows that Paola doesn't actually want to leave, but Paola thanks him and then heads back to her place. Right before she leaves, though, she lets Mitch know that she got a message from the professor's daughter. He passed away. She's going to send flowers to his family on their behalf. The next day, Alex Levy is woken up by a police officer. She started drifting off on the way to the airport, so she decided to pull on over to the road, just take a quick nap. That nap turned into full-on sleep. She gets woken up by an officer who's wondering what exactly she's doing in the middle of a quarantine zone sleeping in her car. She explains that she's heading to the airport. She was visiting a friend, but he's suspicious because of the whole, you know, country being shut down thing. He tells her, I'm not letting you leave until you actually book a flight out of here, but her phone's dead. And the only number that she has on hand is Mitch's. So the police officer has to call Mitch, the only person in the country that she knows. And Alex Levy has to go back to Mitch's hat in hand. When she gets to his house, though, there's a note in the door that just says, come on in. And then when she gets in the living room, there's a plate of food and it says, here's breakfast for you. I'll be upstairs. I really don't want to talk to you anymore. It's too hard. I left the statement for you in the envelope. And Alex starts to break down a little bit. She drops some of the silverware on the ground. And that's when Mitch comes in and says, you know, you didn't have to fly all this way to like mess up my stuff. She starts kind of laughing and they start cleaning it up. But Alex is not doing well. Mitch can see it all over her face. She's crying. She's kind of inconsolable. And as she's crying, she tells Mitch, I don't know who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing. And I just miss you and gives him a hug. Once Alice calms down, Mitch is able to contact somebody and book her a flight out. She's got a flight at 6 a.m. Now they've got a few hours to kill, so they head in the house and start playing Trivial Pursuit. He asks Alex if she can help Paula because of the documentarian thing. Obviously, he doesn't really have the contacts he used to when Alex does. Alex agrees to that, by the way. They then put on some records and start dancing. And then they start talking about cancel culture and how Mitch isn't dead. Maybe his career is, but he's not. And Alex ends up dropping a bombshell on him during this dance session. She tells him that after they did what they did in Chile, a.k.a. the sex stuff, Alex thought she was pregnant. She actually wanted to have it. She was excited to have it. She loved Mitch, not as like a lover, but just as a person. She was so thrilled to make their partnership a lifelong thing. She knew it would be extremely difficult, but she would stay up at night racking her brain on thinking of how she would keep this baby. In the long run, though, wasn't meant to be. She was just late. They ended up spending the rest of the night dancing, drinking wine. But at some point in the middle of the night, they start having a conversation about how Mitch can get bitter sometimes. And that leads him to going to some pretty dark places. He lost everything he thought gave his life meaning. Because of this, he wants to make sure that she appreciates everything she has. They end up falling asleep together, but he ends up waking up in the middle of the night, heading to the bathroom, and when he wakes up, she wakes up. Mitch turns on the television, and it's the news. And after the COVID-19 news, they move into the Mitch Kessler, Alex Levy news. The excerpt from Maggie's book that is to appear in Vanity Fair leaked, the one that says that Mitch Kessler targeted African-American women. And it sends Mitch into a rage. He feels like that they're just trying to dig his grave deeper and deeper. He turns to Alex and says, you don't actually think I targeted black women, do you? I mean, I'm attracted to them. But Alex is really turned off by this news and just says, "Ah, I I gotta go, even though her plane isn't for a few hours. 
He once again asks her, Alex, you didn't actually believe I did that, do you? And Alex says, Mitch, just because you didn't mean to do it doesn't make it okay. And Mitch just can't understand it. The fact that maybe he did something that he didn't realize he was doing at the time, he kind of has a mini breakdown. He whines to Alex, I just want to be a good person. And Alex tells him, I I know, but can't do this right now. I just, I got to go. And Mitch says, so you come here and you get me to tell the world that you are someone you're not. So you don't get canceled like I did. And you'll never tell anybody who you think I really am. I mean, come on. Alex starts getting pretty emotional and Mitch just goes to give her a hug. Alex does ask, can you still release the statement? And Mitch says, sure. Alex then heads off to go catch her flight. Mitch then texts Pala, okay, everything's fine now. Will you come back, please? And Pala says, do you still even want me to come? And Mitch says, actually, can I come to you? I want to be in your world for a while. So Pala says, sure. And Mitch has come over to get a second opinion on the whole targeting black women thing. But instead of giving him an answer, Pala ends up kissing him. Mitch pushes her away saying, I don't think this is a good idea. And Pala says, I know it is because of that. Mitch eventually ends up giving in. The two end up sleeping together. It seems like they both had a good time, but Pala realizes that she's out of cigarettes. Mitch offers to go get them and heads out, and on the drive, he starts going into one of those dark places he was talking about, thinking about every negative thing that he's heard about himself, about how bad of a person he is. He starts drifting off kind of mentally, and as he's turning a corner, he has to swerve out of the way to avoid a car. And that's when he starts going off of a cliff. But instead of re-grabbing the wheel, he actually pulls his hands back. And he just lets the car go straight off. Episode 8 takes place one day after Alex leaves Italy. One day after Bradley kicks her brother out of her house. Corey ends up showing up at the office early because they're launching UBA Plus that day. So it's a big day for him. He ends up running into Chip on the way to his office. And Chip is still stressed out because he can't find Alex. And he's trying to keep that a secret. He ends up calling her once again. She once again doesn't answer. And he ends up leaving a pretty scathing voicemail. And she's not the only one who's stressed out. Mia's pretty stressed out. The Vanity Fair excerpt is going viral, and it's not hard to figure out who they're talking about. Mia even hears a couple of her coworkers discussing the matter not too far away from earshot. And then the final stressed out person is Bradley. She ends up tracking down Laura's assistant and asking when she's going to be there because she wants to talk to her. She then grabs another production assistant and asks him to book Hal a flight out of the city. She runs to her dressing room to call Laura to tell her that she wants to talk to her before the show. And Lara reluctantly tells her, I'm in my dressing room, so what is it? Bradley tells her about the incident with Hal the previous night and about how she kicked him out. But Lara reminds her that she didn't ask her to do that. She also tells her, this is a lot to take on before I go do a show, so I'm going to need to get my head in the right place. Can we talk about this later? Bradley, however, wants to keep talking about it, but Lara has to let in hair and makeup. So Bradley doesn't have a choice but to let her off the phone. When they finally do meet up on set, it's kind of awkward. As TMS kicks off, Corey, Stella, and a couple of the lawyers are discussing all of the negative publicity, and Corey is trying to spin it. It's actually good publicity because it shows the change from UBA from one year ago. Even though Corey continues to push how this is a good thing, the rest of them are pretty concerned about the book. Corey's assistant, Kyle, though, bursts through the door and tells one of the lawyers that he's getting a call and it's pretty urgent, so the lawyer goes to take it. And when he comes back, he puts the person on speakerphone and says, can you repeat that? And it's an Italian journalist trying to get a comment from UBA about the death of Mitch Kessler. And this is the first that any of them are hearing this, so they're pretty floored. The lawyer asks, have you been able to confirm this? But the journalist says, no, 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 I'm not trying to confirm it. I'm asking you for your thoughts on it. The lawyer once again repeats, no, 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 I need to know if you have been able to confirm this is actually true. And the journalist tells him that he was in a car accident in Riva. And Stella points out that if that's there in Lake Como, that's where Mitch was when that girl was caught yelling at him on camera. They end up telling the journalists that the network has no comment until the facts can be verified. But Stella runs down to the newsroom and lets Mia and a couple of the other producers know about this unconfirmed report. And now they're frantically trying to get two confirmed sources. They know this is a big deal. They can't let another network break the news that Mitch Kessler has died. They also realize they can't report it until his family knows. Mia then goes racing down to Alex's dressing room, knocking on the door, and when Chip answers, he starts apologizing for some reason about the excerpt, feeling guilty. But Mia tells him, shut up, Mitch might be dead. I need you to get Alex in here. This might be fake news, but the network wants her on standby because they want her to break the story if it ends up being true. So Chip runs off to try to track down Alex while the rest of the producers start combing the internet 
to try to find out if this could be true. They get some information, like they do get pictures of a car accident, but they don't actually get any confirmation that Mitch was killed in it. Slowly, though, they start piecing together some details that could help them out, like the car's license plate. They check the registration and check who that is. As the group is slowly trying to track down confirmation as well as Alex upstairs, Stella questions Corey about how wise of a decision it is to have Alex break this news. And while Corey gets the bad optics of it, possibly, he also thinks it's extremely compelling. Stella then gets a phone call on her personal cell, and it's from the head of YDA. He lets them know that they're standing down. This is their story to break. But he does give them some information they've gotten, and that's the hospital where they reportedly took Mitch to. Stella ends up calling Mia down in the newsroom to tell her about this information, and that's yet more information they can use to possibly get the two confirmed sources. Chip isn't able to figure out that Alex was in Italy, and it sends Chip into a bit of a panic. He's worried that she might have been in the car with Mitch. So he calls down in the newsroom to figure out if they've been able to confirm. But Joel, the producer, tells him that he's currently on the phone with the hospital they reportedly took Mitch to. And Chip screams at him to give him that hospital's information so that Chip can call as well. Chip ends up calling and getting a hold of the hospital right after Joel. And Chip starts asking if there's confirmation on Mitch Kessler. But because of the fact that Italy is at war with the coronavirus, the nurse doesn't really have a lot of time. She's trying to rush him off the phone. She does tell Chip that they did get somebody matching Mitch's description, but he didn't have ID. Chip asked the nurse, was there a woman with him? And she says, yeah, and honestly, she wasn't doing very good. Chip then asks if it was Alex Levy, but the woman says, I don't know. But Chip at this point is absolutely fearing the worst. He ends up bursting into Corey's office, interrupting a meeting between him and Stella and telling them, I think Alex might be dead. He comes clean with the fact that he actually hasn't been talking to Alex this entire time. He just found out where she was. Stella asks him, have you talked to her family? But he says, no, I can't tell her family. Nobody knows that she's even there. I don't want to scare the crap out of him. And Corey questions, wait, how does nobody know that she's there? And that's when Chip comes clean that Alex's assistant told him. So Corey demands that they get Alex's assistant in the building right away. And as they await Alex's assistant's arrival, downstairs, Mia has to tell the crew of what's going on. She can't let the morning show continue to go on with everybody in the dark. So she tells them about the unconfirmed rumor that Mitch Kessler is dead, but also asks that they don't tell anybody because his family doesn't even know yet. She then goes back in the newsroom to try to confirm their rumors. And she ends up getting a phone call back from the person whose car was involved in the crash. He confirms with Mia that that was indeed his car. He also confirms that Mitch was staying at his Italian place. And as far as he knows, the rumors, unfortunately, are true. And that's good enough for Mia. So she has one source, but now she needs two. While the producers go off and try to get that second confirmed source, she starts typing up exactly what the anchor, whoever it is, is going to say if they're able to confirm the story. A little while later, Alex's assistant does arrive at the UBA office. She meets with Stella, and Stella guilt trips her into telling them about the flight back home. It lands in 30 minutes, so Chip takes off, trying to meet her at the airport. But as if there weren't enough chaotic things going on that day, Bradley has an issue, because Hal has shown up at the UBA offices and he is totally under the influence of something. Security tried to apprehend him, but he kept saying he was Bradley Jackson's brother, so they alerted her to the issue, and during a break, she went up and met with him. He stumbles in asking, why is everybody walking around here like it's a morgue? And she says, because there's a rumor that Mitch Kessler died, so can you keep your voice down? But he doesn't. He continues to make a scene. And when Laura Peterson comes in the room and checks on Bradley to see if she's coming back, it causes Hal to make an even bigger scene. At this point, a crowd's kind of emerged, and Hal starts smashing glasses. Laura screams for security to come in and grab him, and it's totally embarrassing for Bradley. She goes and hides in her dressing room. Laura ends up going after her and giving her a hug and telling her, you gotta go back out there, but Bradley feels like she can't. And Laura reminds her, no, you can. It'll be okay. I mean, people judging you's a bitch, but it won't kill you. And Bradley starts beating herself up over the way that she treated Hal. Laura reminds her, you're not a horrible person, but you do need to take a cold, hard look at your life. She asks Bradley, have you ever had therapy? But Bradley says, no, I'm afraid they'll tell me I'm crazy. Laura tells her, you're not crazy. You just grew up in a crazy environment. At this point, Bradley's crying and tells Laura, my family just screwed me up so much and I love them so much, but I can't fix them. So Laura tells her, maybe it's time you stepped away from them. Bradley starts defending Hal, saying that it's not his fault. And Laura tells her, I know it's not his fault, but at some point, It doesn't matter why he's the way he is. It matters that he's bringing chaos to your life. At some point, Bradley, you got to think about you. To make Bradley feel a little bit better about the situation, Laura tells her, I've had to walk away from people in my family. It's not easy. But in the end, it's just harder to deal with them. 
Bradley, though, can't imagine leaving Hal. And Laura says, okay, well, if he's willing to change, then put him in rehab. But honestly, I think it's a situation where you have to walk away. They then get back on set and try to finish the morning show. At this point, Chip has made his way to the airport just in enough time for Alex to step off the plane. And she's actually crying. She's not crying because of the Mitch news. She has no idea about that. She's happy because Chip was there to greet her. Chip then has to break the news to her. And at first, she's in complete denial because she was just with him. But he gives her all the details and also lets her know that UBA wants her to report it if they're able to confirm it. Alex then realizes she has somebody that might be able to confirm it. She gets Chip's phone and ends up calling Paula. And Paula tells Alex, you know, he cared about you so much. But the reports are true. He's dead. And Alex starts breaking down in complete disbelief. They start driving back to the UBA office together once Alex has calmed down. And Alex tells Chip that she can't go back to the office right away. They have to tell Mitch's family. And they can't call Mitch's family. This has to be a one-on-one conversation. So Chip ends up calling Mia back and has her on speakerphone. And Mia demands to know where they are. But Alex ends up speaking up. She tells Mia that the reports unfortunately are true. But the decision not to come back right away is hers. She needs to tell Mitch's ex before she breaks anything on the air. She promises that when they let Paige know, they'll let UBA know, and then they can go on air with it. Right after she hangs up, though, her phone starts blowing up, and it's a bunch of voicemails from Chip. Chip knows exactly what's on those voicemails, so he tries to tell her, you don't have to pay attention to that, I was just tracking you down, but she ends up listening to the latest one, it's pretty damning, and it causes a pretty big fight between the two. And they continue to fight all the way to Paige's house, but when they get there, it seems like... They've settled down a little bit. At least Alex has to. She has to tell Paige. She knocks on the door, and Paige doesn't answer. Mitch's youngest son does. Alex tells him, can you go get your mom? And when Paige comes to the door, she's a little bit surprised, but that's when Alex breaks the news. Alex asks her, do you need anything? But instead of asking for support, Paige kind of rips into Alex for sleeping with Mitch. Tells Alex, you know, I knew there were other girls, but you actually knew me. And Alex tells her it was only two times, but that doesn't make Paige feel any better. Paige kind of laughs at the comment and says, you know, you two were made for each other. I'm sorry for your loss, and then shuts the door. When she gets back in the car, she calls Mia up and tells her that she alerted Paige to the news. But then she asks Mia to put Bradley on the phone because she doesn't want to be the one to break the news. And she tells Bradley that she should be the one to actually tell the world that Mitch Kessler has died because Bradley was the one that really spurned on the change at UBA. So Bradley goes back on the air, covers the good, covers the bad, but tells the world that Mitch Kessler has died. And in episode 9, even the day after, UBA employees are still trying to process the death of Mitch Kessler. And Bradley also has the issue of her brother sitting on her couch. Her brother apologizes for what happened the previous day, making a fool of her at her office, and even agreeing to finally go to rehab. So she's going to take off Monday, and she's going to take him down to the rehab facility. She then heads into work and gets ready to do the show. And the show is still missing Alex. And now that she's back, she has to atone for her sins. Her and her agent head into UBA to talk about her return. And that's all that Corey really cares about is when is she coming back? Because they paid a lot of money for Alex. Corey is being as supportive as he can, telling her any backlash you get, we will back you. But Alex has made up her mind. She tells him that she will be coming back Monday. But March 16th is her last day at TMS. She's giving back all of the money, which is something her agent has an issue with, but she's planning on letting him keep the commission, so, you know, that's kind of cool. But this really puts a wrench in the plans that Corey had for the morning show, but also for his network. So he asks for the room alone with Alex, trying to convince her that this isn't the right thing to do. He gives her an awesome speech about pinball, and somehow Corey actually makes it work. But the issue is, Maggie's book comes out the very next day, March 17th. And now that Alex knows what's in it, she knows she's going to be canceled. So she would rather just get ahead of this thing and fly off into the sunset before it can get really bad. She then heads down to the studio to go see Bradley, who she also hasn't seen in quite some time. She tells Bradley, I'll be back Monday. They advertised you and me, and I think we should give it to him. Bradley warns her, though, I'm not going to be in Monday. They're actually having Laura fill in, so maybe wait for Tuesday? Alex says, no, I'll be there, and I'll see you Tuesday. Bradley then asks her, maybe next week we can get a drink, because when you came back, I feel like I had all these barriers up. And Alex says, you know, I really love that, but you might want to distance yourself from me for a little bit. Bradley has no idea what she's talking about, and Alex just says, have a good weekend, and walks out. But as she's heading out, she sees Paige, Mitch's ex-wife slash widow, kind of. And Paige has come in, hat in hand, to ask the UBA employees for something. She gets ushered in by Rena, who, by the way, is the first person we see wearing a mask, and 
She feels pretty weird. <laughs> Those were fun days. But it's not like Paige feels comfortable. She also feels extremely uncomfortable having to do this. But they have most of the morning show staffers waiting for her. And she tells them that she knows this is a weird request, but she wants them to all come to the memorial service for Mitch. It's not like she's happy about this. She just spent the last day trying to plan a memorial service for somebody that she can't stand. But her kids asked her, are daddy's friends going to be there? And she didn't know what to tell them. So she's just coming to them as a mother, asking them to show up. Not for Mitch, but for his kids. As she's about to leave, though, she sees Alex, and she just stares at her and walks out. And Alex is frozen still in Paige's presence. We fast forward to Monday. Bradley ends up driving Hal to a bougie rehab facility. As he's walking in, Hal brings up to her about going on a trip, but she tells him, I can't. It was tough for me to get off today. And Hal starts pleading with her to just really go anywhere, something for him to look forward to. But she says, Hal, can you just stop? I love you, but I'm not going to be able to see you when you get out. She starts explaining that she's worked way too hard to get where she is and she can't move backwards. So while it's tough for her, she doesn't think it's a good idea that they continue to talk after today. And as you can probably imagine, Hal is extremely upset by this. Hal screams at her, what's the point of getting clean if my family isn't even going to be here when I get out? He then starts refusing to go inside, and Bradley tells him, I can't make you go to rehab. Hope you do. I want you to get healthy, but you are a grown adult. I've paid for this place, so figure it out. I'm leaving, and you can't come with me. They continue to bicker and argue, and Bradley pulls out a wad of cash and gives it to him and says, Do you want money? Here, here's money. Here's a few hundred bucks. And he tries to guilt trip her by saying, well, What happens if I buy drugs with this and then I OD, and then you'll never see me again? And that's the final straw for Bradley, who says, Stop it. This is your life. Go in. Don't go in. But at the end of the day, this is your life. Figure out what you want to do with it. Bradley would much rather be at the morning show, which is where Alex returns. As she's walking in, Mia lets her know that just as a precaution because of the whole coronavirus thing, they're planning on putting studios in Anchor's houses, just in case. And since Alex isn't planning on being there past March 16th, she tries to hint at her, yeah, I don't think that's really necessary, but she gets out of the conversation once she sees Chip. And she didn't expect him to see him because she hadn't heard from him. And he says, yeah, how does that feel, by the way? He realized that might have been a little hard, so he tells her, I'm going to stick around until you find somebody new to produce you or until you get canceled, whatever happens first. And then he just walks off. Seconds later, Laura walks up to her and says, hey, Alex, I just want to make sure before we go out there, we're professionals, right? And Alex says, yeah, of course. And once the camera rolls, the two of them are great. I mean, they genuinely have really good chemistry to the point where after the show, Alex goes and visits Laura in her dressing room because she wants to know why Laura hates her so much. She felt like they were friends, and then all of a sudden, they weren't. And Laura tells her her side of things, about how Alex wanted to be with her when she was famous and popular, but all of a sudden, one day, she wasn't, and Alex wanted nothing to do with her. And while she doesn't come right out and say it, she does hint about the fact that Alex was the one who leaked the information about her being a lesbian to the press. And Alex admits that she did gossip, but her tails it by saying everybody was gossiping back then. Alex says to her, I wish we had straightened that out back then. And Laura asks her, what would you have said if I asked you back then if you were gossiping? And Alex admits, probably would have denied it. Alex then gets ready to leave and tells her, I really enjoyed the show today, and it would have been fun to be friends all these years. I'm really sorry I screwed that up. And Laura, to make her feel better, says, I said shit about you too, so it happens. Alex goes home and checks out UBA+. Plus. In particular, the new Peeler Bullard interview show. And the first guest is Corey Ellison. And they cover the Maggie Brenner book. And Corey actually invites Maggie on the air anytime she wants. Come on over to UBA and talk to us. And Maggie ends up accepting it. As soon as he gets off the Peter Bullard show, Corey ends up calling Bradley and asking her to be the one to interview Maggie. And it's because she's the one that's farthest removed from the thing. She doesn't have a dog in the fight. Bradley says sure. And in order to get her fully prepared for the interview, the publishing company is going to allow her to read the book early. The next day, she heads to the publishing company and reads it page for page, and it is pretty scathing. It's a bad look for Alex. A lot of it Bradley didn't know, and it fully prepares her to interview Maggie. But while Bradley is nose deep in a book, that is also the day that Mitch Kessler is having his memorial service. One person who was planning on going was Yanko Flores, who the previous night ended up running into Claire on the street. They decided to reconnect, 
and they were having a blast. She asks him about hanging out, but he says, oh, I can't that day. And he's trying to avoid telling her that he was planning on going to the memorial service, but she ends up pulling it out of him. And when she finds out that Yanko is going to support Mitch, she ends up freaking out at him because she feels like Mitch was the reason why her friend died. And Mitch is one of the main reasons why she got out of the business. She tells Yanko, I'm glad he's dead, and I hope that Fred Micklin is next, him and all of his money that he got. She also ends up revealing to Yanko that she is helping Hannah's dad sue the company, which is something that Yanko didn't know. Yanko wanted to try to explain to her, though, why he was going, but he doesn't get the chance. She just walks off. So Yanko's definitely headed there, but one person who is torn with going is Alex. She doesn't think it's her place, but she also wants to go because she does feel like it's her place. And while she ponders it, the memorial service starts out, and it's really awkward. People are trying to avoid the elephant in the room, but one person who is not avoiding it is Dick Lundy. He gets up there, and he's a little buzzed, but he completely rips into cancel culture. A little while after the speeches, Alex does end up walking into the room. The first person she sees is Fred, but she just kind of has an awkward interaction where neither of them talk. And that's when she sees a friendly face. Paula. Paula is as thrilled to see Alex as Alex is to see her. She tells Paula that she promised Mitch that she would help Paula introduce her to the right people when she's ready. But Paula admits, I'm not really ready at this time. And Alex warns her, well, I'm about to be canceled, so you probably should be ready quickly before these people stop returning my phone calls. Alex then, in the middle of everybody, makes a speech. She asks Paige to just let her say what she has to say, knowing that it's going to be difficult for Paige. But she comes to the defense of Mitch. She tells the group that she was with Mitch in Italy. She was with him the day before he died. And what she saw was a man who was truly sorry. He had a wife and two beautiful kids that he didn't deserve. She then looks at Paige and just says, I'm so sorry for all of it, and leaves. She goes home and turns on UBA Plus to watch the interview with Maggie. But it doesn't go the way that she expected. It doesn't go the way that anybody expected. Bradley, having the ability to bury Alex, actually comes to her defense. Bradley paints Maggie as a bitter person who's trying to pour dirt on a grave. Everything that Maggie says, Bradley is able to spin it in a positive pro-Alex direction. Like when Maggie brings up this crazy woman knocking on her door, demanding that she take stuff out of her book, Bradley points out, So a woman came to you in need who had made a mistake years ago and asked you to take something out of your book and you decided to leave it in anyway. She also paints Alex as a person who simply made a mistake and asks Maggie, let's go through the list of people that you're not proud you slept with. I mean, it is a really good look, not just for Bradley, but also for Alex. Alex is completely appreciative, and instead of being canceled, Twitter lights up with pro-Alex support. Maggie Brenner is made to look like a bitter writer trying to latch onto a cash grab. After the interview, Laura comes over to Bradley's house to hang out. And Laura's surprised at the reaction because when they first talked, Bradley said that she didn't like Alex. But Bradley tells her that she believed everything she said. She does owe her career to Alex. Laura then brings up that with all the coronavirus thing hitting New York, she's going to head to her place in Montana. She kind of just wants to lay low. She then asks Bradley to come, saying, I don't like what my woman works. And Bradley says, are you serious? And Laura says, no, I realize you have a job. But Bradley was talking about the whole, my woman. Asking her, am I your woman? And Laura says, you scare me a little, but yeah. They start making out, but then Bradley gets a knock at the door, and it's the bellhop who drops off a package that was delivered earlier. When Bradley opens it up, it's all the money that she gave Hal. She asks the bellhop if the person's still there, but he says, no, it was delivered before my shift. And now Bradley is really stressed out on what's going on with her brother. The world goes to bed, though, because everybody has work the next day. But when Alex wakes up, she opens up Twitter, and the world has turned on her. Instead of being pro-Alex, they're talking about leaked footage. Alex starts to freak out a little bit, and a quick search reveals that her speech at Mitch's memorial service was leaked. And it was leaked by Fred Micklin, who was looking to get revenge. He was recording her the whole time. And it's not a good look for somebody who mere hours ago had their coworker saying that what she did with Mitch was a mistake in the past. Because now you've got Alex saying that she was with Mitch just less than a week ago. It's also not a good look because she just came from a coronavirus hotspot. So she's getting ripped twofold. One, for having some sort of a relationship with Mitch, but also for putting her coworkers in danger. She's so frazzled she ends up tripping over a shoe and knocking her head pretty good. She's found by Mitch and taken to the hospital. She wakes up and her agent's calling her up and she asks what happened and her agent fills her in. But her agent also tells her, they tested you for coronavirus when you entered the hospital. Alex, you tested positive. And in the season finale, the morning show has to continue without Alex. It also continues without Bradley because she's out searching for Hal. So Daniel is the lead anchor. 
He does make a statement on UVA's behalf on the situation with Alex, making the comments at Mitch's memorial, but also coming back from Italy and putting her coworkers in danger. UVA vows to look into the matter. But Corey isn't really worried about Alex, who has returned home, by the way, and is feeling like crap. He's more concerned with the UBA Plus launch party. It's going to be a huge event, and it's going to include Tom Hanks. But Sybil's concerned. She's wearing a mask, and she wants to know how much it's going to cost to postpone. But Corey doesn't want to postpone at all. He even questions her on whether or not she wants Corey to fail. And Sybil tells him, no, but I think you will fail, and the market agrees. People are shorting this company, but I am pulling for you. And Corey then begs her, then let me get this off the ground. She then asks, is this about the streaming service or is this about you? And Corey admits they're one and the same. And that is Sybil's cue to leave. She gets up saying, I'm not risking getting sick for this crap. As Corey was in the meeting with Sybil, Stella and Mia were in a meeting, or I should say a Zoom call with HR and legal. They needed to figure out what to do about Alex. And that's when Alex calls Stella to let her know that she's tested positive for COVID. And all of a sudden, the mood changes completely. Stella tells Mia to get everybody that came in contact with Alex out of the building immediately. So Mia flies down to the set to let the staff know that a member has tested positive, although it doesn't take much to figure out who it was. Even though both Alex and Bradley are missing, most of the onus is put on Alex. And the staff wants Mia to tell them who tested positive, but she can't because of confidentiality purposes. Mia, though, takes control of the meeting and tells them that for the time being, they're all to do their jobs remotely if they can do it. Stella then comes down, and as everybody's shuffling out, she pulls Daniel aside and says, you're going to anchor TMS for the next few days. And Daniel says, no, I'm not. He tells Stella that his grandfather is in a nursing home in California, and he needs to make sure that he's okay. He can't put him on a plane, so he has to drive there. Stella says, then let us help, but I need you here. Daniel, I know you felt sidelined, and that's not right. Then show us how wrong we are. And Daniel says, if you don't know by now, then you're never going to know. Stella tries to remind him that he was in China, and this could be one of the biggest news stories of their lifetime, and he's the right person in the right time to tell it. But he just rolls his eyes when she says people need the news. He pulls up a cell phone and says, this is the news. We are the news for people that have way too much time on their hands. He starts walking out, and Stella reminds him, Daniel, you're under contract. And he chuckles and says, so everybody else gets to walk out, but I have to sit here because I'm under contract? Try this one out. I quit. And then he walks right up to Stella's face and says, and by the way, my grandfather thinks I have the it factor. And Stella can't believe that Mia told Daniel what she told her in that meeting. Mia, though, then asks Stella, have you even told Corey about what's going on with Alex? And Stella realizes, no, she hasn't. So she runs up to tell Corey, who's in a meeting with somebody about UBA+. She wants to be covert about it, so she starts writing post-it notes to him, saying that Alex has tested positive and that the company let her come back to work knowing that she was in Italy. It's a really bad look. They end up kicking the UBA plus guy out of the room so they can just talk amongst themselves, and they just can't believe that Alex Levy continues to screw UBA over. They then start discussing what to do about the situation, making a statement, but also contact tracing. All of this is new to them. They have no idea what to do because they're not medical professionals or TV people. Stella, though, is very concerned with the fact they let her come back from Italy. And Corey says, wait, there's reasonable doubt. She came back 14 days ago. We don't know that she actually got it from Italy. She could have gotten it here. If she got it in Italy, she's an idiot. But if she got it here, she's an unlucky, grieving woman who deserves our sympathy. And grieving is one way to put it. She's not so much grieving. She feels like she's dying. She's not having trouble breathing at all, but her whole body is on fire. That night, it's so bad that she can't sleep, so she calls the one person who she knows will answer, Chip. And even though the relationship hasn't been great recently, he stays on the phone with her for most of the night. This spurns on an idea, though. He heads to UBA and runs into Corey, who's walking out of the building. And this is a big news day because the World Health Organization just announced a pandemic. Yanko Flores is manning the morning show. UBA Plus is supposed to have their launch party. It's a disaster. Not a great time for Corey to take a meeting on the street. But what Chip pitches him is letting Alex go on camera because of the fact she's dealing with COVID. Corey brings up the fact that they're trying to keep that a secret, but he says, why? It's good to get out anyway. This whole nation is grieving and they're terrified. Put Alex on camera. They know Alex. They're comfortable with Alex. And it'll become real if they see Alex struggling with it. Alex isn't going to die from this, but she could end up saving lives from it. It takes some convincing, but Corey doesn't think it's a bad idea at all. 
He ends up calling Stella and telling her to block off some time on UBA to put Alex on TV, struggling with COVID. Stella, though, marches into Corey's office and says, I can't do that. If we put Alex on TV with all the negative publicity that's going on, advertisers will pull. So Corey says, fine, we won't put her on UBA. We'll put her on UBA+. Plus. There's no sponsors to lose there. As far as subscribers, nobody subscribed. So I'll put on what I want to put on. It's Corey+. Plus. And Corey is really excited about the idea. He tells Chip, and now it's up to Chip to try to convince Alex. Chip heads over to Alex's apartment, and she yells at him, reminding him, you're an idiot, I have COVID. But that's when he tells her, Alex, it's fine, I tested positive. Immediately, Alex feels completely guilty. But Chip tells her, I I feel fine, I might be asymptomatic. He then tries to picture the idea of going on TV to tell the world about COVID-19. She pushes back right off the bat, but Chip reminds her, you need something to focus on. We talked about this last night. This could be it. And just like with Corey, it takes a little bit of convincing, but Alex ends up coming around and agreeing to it. Back over at the office, though, Corey is ready to head out because he's got a busy day. Stock exchange, UBA Plus party, and wedged in there was supposed to be a meeting with Paola, but he canceled it. Because he had no idea who Paola was. This was just a favor for Alex. But Paola isn't the type to get canceled on. She ends up walking into the office and demanding that meeting with Corey. Corey, though, tries to explain how he doesn't have time, but she says, two minutes. I need two minutes. This is a favor to Alex Levy, and what I have to bring you is really good. So Corey reluctantly agrees to watch her stuff for two minutes. But as soon as he sees what it is, he ends up watching the whole damn thing. The whole Mitch Kessler documentary front to back. And he agrees. It is really good. He wants to put it on UBA+. But Pallas says no. I made a promise to Mitch that I wouldn't betray him. Without him, I never would have made this thing. So what I'm looking for is a job, but I'm not looking to put this out there. Corey, though, is being rushed out by his assistant. He's got to get going. So he makes one last plea to Paola to agree to put it out to the public. He says that what he saw in this documentary wasn't the monster that is being portrayed as Mitch Kessler. He saw a changed man. And maybe if they put it out there, it could dispel that myth. So Paola has Alex to thank for that meeting, and Alex is still struggling, but there's one person she wants to talk to before she goes on camera, and that's Bradley. She still hasn't thanked Bradley for being by her side in that Maggie Brenner interview. She asks Bradley, why did you do it? And Bradley says, because it's true. I mean, we're friends. We're not good friends, but we're friends nonetheless. Bradley then reveals to Alex what's going on with Hal about how he's missing, and Alex gives Bradley a talk that she probably needs to hear. Families are messed up. You know why? Because they're full of people. So if you want to cut ties with them, go ahead. But if not, own him. Just like the way you own me with my crap. She then asks Bradley, I mean, have you put a video out or something I need to retweet? I haven't been on social media for obvious reasons. And Bradley hasn't done it because she's kind of scared of the negative perception that Bradley's brother's a drug addict. But this conversation with Alex made her realize that she does need to put a video out. So she puts a video on her Instagram telling the public what's going on with Hal and trying to get any information that might be able to save him. That night, Bradley is about to head out to go do another loop around the city trying to find Hal when she gets a knock at her door, and it's Corey. Corey had seen her Instagram video, and she's surprised to see Corey because he's supposed to be at the UBA Plus party, but he gave in. He canceled. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson were supposed to be there. They contracted COVID. He got word that the NBA was shutting down. It just wasn't good optics to have this party, no matter how much he wanted to. So while it pained him, he made the call to cancel it. But when he saw the video of Bradley, he wanted to help. So he came to her room and said, I'll do whatever you want. So the two head off to try to find Hal together. They walk through a homeless encampment, but he's nowhere to be seen. Bradley is really stressed out, and Corey asks, Laura's in Montana, right? And Bradley says, yeah, it's probably for the best. She thinks my family's crazy. And that's when Corey has to get something off his chest. You think it's going to be that Corey was the one to reveal the relationship between Laura and Bradley, but no, it's bigger than that. Corey says, I love you. He starts kind of trying to explain himself, but at the end of the day, it's, I love you. She can't really process it, though, because she gets a phone call on her tip line from a nurse at a hospital that has a patient that fits Hal's description, but he doesn't have any identification. When Bradley heads to that hospital, she's able to sneak in because it is extremely packed, and she is able to find Hal. Hal promises her, I didn't use Bradley, I just got beat up. And while Bradley is mad at Hal for doing what he did, she also is extremely relieved. Now while all that's going on, Alex Levy is on camera. The UBA Plus show starts out as a normal one. Alex is putting on a good face, but she's clearly dealing with some stuff. She does reveal during the show that Chip also contracted COVID, which prompts a phone call from his fiancée. 
And what you end up finding out is Chip didn't contract COVID. In fact, he tested negative. He just came to the apartment because he knows it's what Alex needed. He didn't end up answering that phone call from his fiance because he's busy producing the show. And the show ends up going from the Alex that you know from the morning show to being an Alex who is tired of apologizing for who she is. She ends up doing something that you don't hear her do on TV. Cursing. Ranting about the people that are trying to cancel her. The whole time mixed in is different interviews and snippets of doctors talking about COVID. She signs off by saying, you've all meant a lot to me over the years. And I want to thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. So stay safe, stay sane, and I'll see you later. And that is the end of season two of The Morning Show. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. I appreciate it. Consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. Let's talk about the comments section. I don't read it because people are either nitpicking, pointing out every mistake you made, or just generally it's a cesspool. So if you say something, chances are I'm probably not going to see it. Every once in a while I see a comment, and it's always the negative ones. But just know, I appreciate you all watching, even the people that need to nitpick. So at this point, I'm kind of like Alex Levy. I'm done apologizing. Watch it. Don't. I don't care. Thanks so much. See ya.